According to SEAL's uh, uh, report, uh, international students in Norway, foreign students are satisfied with a lot of things when they, when they study here. They are satisfied with quality, organization, and price of the education. Obviously, it's free. <laughs> but, um, on the other hand, they are dissatisfied with a few things, climate, and they feel that getting to know Norwegians is hard. As my old uncle would, said, uh, would have said, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. <laughs> However, uh, it's not granted that everyone is capable of developing the tools necessary to rectify the problems. Ursula Brinkman runs Intercultural Business Improvement, which provides advice on, inter uh, on intercultural management. In her lecture, she will explain how intercultural competence can be developed. And for those of us who are still unsure about what intercultural competence actually is, she will tell us absolutely everything we need to know. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thanks also for where is he for waking up the audience? Hi, thank you. Good job. Um, because our, the, this is the graveyard shift, so uh, <laughs> thank you, organization team. You know, I had, was thinking of some provocative remarks to shake you up, but I can skip those now. Okay, um, uh, so how do students develop intercultural competencies? Uh, we're going to look at a couple of factors that can now be identified and I hope I put that together both in the terms of, okay, so what, so what, now what? Uh, so especially the now what, so what can one do to help students develop these competencies might be of interest. Okay, so um, first of all, there's nothing as personal as culture. And these are pictures that my nephew and my niece have taken when they got out last year. I infected them with the virus, and the first thing they did when they started, um, my nephew, he spent six weeks in Chile, Argentina, and ended in Rio. Um, so here it says 1.67 kilometers up to Bolivia, and he came back kind of like, wow, so he did it. Um, and this is the Christmas tree uh, in Tanzania. Uh, <laughs> so a picture from uh, my niece who spent their 10 weeks on a doctor's internship for her doctoral studies. And again, she also had a couple of very interesting experiences um, um, and also really intercultural experiences that by talking with her intercultural trainer, coach, aunt about it, hopefully she can better place. Okay, so what I, can you expect from today's uh, session? And I have 18 minutes. First, why go abroad? Why, why do students do this? And then we're going to look at um, the intercultural readiness framework, which my company has developed, which focuses on four intercultural competencies. And we're gonna, gonna look at what these competencies are, of course, and some of the research findings that we have on these competencies, which might be interesting to, to see, okay, so what does this tell you about the work you are doing and what your students, students are developing? Uh, so then we're also gonna look at the findings, what do students need to develop uh, these competencies? And last but not least, and here we come to the now what part, the teams for the future, okay. Uh, employer perspective, and probably we can be, I can be fast with this because you're probably very, very familiar with why employers want this. Um, clients and staff um, are more and more diverse, culturally mixed, and that will be a trend that will continue. So diversity in, within every company is going to stay. Then also, th this is just one website which gives some specific and nice numbers, the BPB website. Uh, which says that over the past 30 years or so, the numbers of employees working for transnational corporations has quadrupled, more than quadrupled. So an enormous amount of people who now work across borders every day, it's part of their normal experience. So organizations need people who somehow know how to do this. 
And we call this then intercultural competencies, that they have a certain set of competencies, specific competencies which go further than just interpersonal skills or social skills, some specific extra competencies um, that will help them to deal with this new phase of the work workplace. And here, probably you've seen this also from the European uh, higher education framework, six of 10 employers give extra credit for international experiences. And students, they know that, of course. So they know that um, their future employers will be wondering whether they have developed these competencies. Um, and then there's also the effect of if others do it, I do it. So one of the friends of my nephew who said, you know, actually I'm more one of the kind of like, you know, born close to the church. So he kind of like also thought, well, if, if my friends go out, I also have to go out. And he spent a whole year in the US and on the way meeting all presidential candidates that came, you know, along this midtown city. So it's kind of like that they, they're infecting each other. The personal opportunities may be less uh, sophisticated than we would want them to be. Uh, certainly just a matter of curiosity and flying out. But it's also, you know, just fun meeting new people, people who are different from those I met in my hometown. And I want to come back with some nice stories to tell. Um, and yes, you know, if I need to say it so, become more open, be less dependent, and I've proven myself. So very, very you know, uh, nice and adventurous streaks for this. Um, so how do they, and all of this somehow, at some point we say what, what they develop there, ideally what they would develop, that would be some set of competencies that we can measure and that we can systematically develop and that have been shown to make a difference for being interculturally effective. Uh, so what do they need? I mean, m most of them just go abroad and the question is, is going abroad enough? Do just by being abroad, do the right things happen? Or does something else need to happen as well? And secondly, what are the decisive factors? What do we know from this? And we're going to look at some expatriate research literature, uh, where by now there's some serious and massive work being done to, to look at that. Um, and look at a virtual circle. So. Um, for you, this may be more part of everyday reality that a um, Norwegian student, in this case, is about to leave for, a, for a, you know, a traineeship outside. And this was one Dutch student we came across, and she was about to spend six weeks in Lyon, in one of the best patisseries in France, to, to learn the tricks of the trade there. And so what is her mindset? What are her expectations before she goes? And are these expectations the ones that help her get the most out of this experience? Will she go and simply focus on the technical challenge, learning to make these wonderful pastries, um, learn a bit of French and having a good time? Or will she be guided in focusing on specific skills and competencies that might be needed and that she could develop? Will she have a conversation around those competencies and how she could use the time abroad to develop these, and maybe even set her own developmental goals, uh, developing these competencies, but even going further, how she could use these competencies for her own goals. So the kind of preparation is very important. This is, this is our framework of four competencies, uh, less is more, we said. Um, so take a look, intercultural sensitivity, that is kind of like, do we see other people's perspectives? How actively are we interested in people from other cultures and where they come from? With the focus on active interest, do we go out there by ourselves to get that information? Or do we wait until something interesting happens? People with high scores on this competence, they always go out by themselves. They try and get that information about people from other cultures. Communication, a classic, um, can we adjust how we communicate? Let's keep it short for today. Building commitment is a more interesting one, certainly also one later in the career. Can we get a group of people together um, to, to build joint goals and to get people committed to these joint goals? 
And managing uncertainty, a very interesting one, probably also uh, correlated with some people say intercultural curiosity, is kind of like a really wanting a bit of perhaps also the thrill, the adventure, the something, go for something different and ready to take a bit of a risk. And this is certainly something that affects students who go abroad from the start. So it's good to know how uncertainty affects them and how they have learned to, to manage this uncertainty so that one can guide them in the course of the, you know, while they are abroad and coming home. With the questionnaire that we developed, people fill it in, it's a self-assessment on these four competencies and people get a report. Uh, in an 11, 11 page report, depending on the language. In French, it's usually 12 pages. They need more words. <laughs> so, um, are young people now really more competent? Competent? Who believes that they are more competent than the um, adult, adult people, the real adults? Hands up. Who believes that young people are more competent? Okay, okay. Yeah, when we heard about the Brexit, et cetera, you know, all the young people who went, who were interviewed, they said, you know, gosh, you just took away from me the opportunity to live and study in 26 countries. Thank you very much. So that was kind of like, we felt, you know, they got it. They're already there. And we have quite a big database by now from several thousand people, and they also clicked five, one of five age boxes, and what you see here is that um, the, those who did not ha raise their hands, they had the uh, intuition that fits the scheme. So um, th those younger than 21 years, they have they score lowest on our competence measurement. This is a way of showing relationships uh, to each other. This is just a way of calculating the data. This is the lowest, lowest scores here, um, and that shows that they are systematically, significantly scoring lower on the competence assessment. So the question is, what happens when they go abroad? What mindset do they have? What skill set? And how does that skill set interact with what's happening abroad? Then those between 21 and 28, a bit better, but still kind of like not as competent as they are growing older. So those of you who have gray hair by now, there's one benefit, you know, at least you're scoring higher on the intercultural readiness check. Um, <laughs> so what do students need to benefit from study abroad? Um, so let's look at expatriate um, literature. There are two important criteria, adjustment. Uh, do you feel okay or do you, are you stressed out? Um, adjustment, and what has been done there is by now um, a massive meta-analysis by Baskar Srinivas and her team uh, from more than 8,000 experts from over 60 studies. Um, what mattered for adjustment were the relational skills. Also job clarity and happiness of the non-working partner, but in terms of soft skills, it was really relational skills were ex important for adjusting well. What played absolutely no role was whether these experts had been abroad before. So your international students, if they are later sent out as experts, something else needs to happen. So what do they need to perform? Uh, Moledal, uh, again, a meta-analysis, I'm going to click a bit uh, faster. These are some of the person personal skills that came out to be uh, important as important. Again, what did not matter, whether experts had been abroad before. Even worse, these competencies don't just stay at a certain level, which is sort of something we think. We only think about how can we increase them, but we might have to ask the question, how can we keep them from dropping down? And this is the result by Marianne van Bakel, a PhD thesis in touch with the Dutch. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, we're going to talk about later today. Um, uh, expatriates in the Netherlands, oh, this open and liberal country, actually, it's the hardest to make contacts to the locals. And those expats who did not make, get in touch with the locals, they had lower scores on open-mindedness after nine months in the Netherlands. So time as such doesn't do it. What does it? Here again, two studies from the uh, student um, research both show that, both on personality development and on self-esteem, both studies show that it's not just the time abroad, it's the integration, the social contact, the relationships 
with locals, in this case probably local students. So the report from Norway showing that there is still some work to do, um, which is probably the same in all countries, the key challenge really is to get local students and international students to actually interact with one another. That's the key. Um, so, um, and this is also uh, quite interesting. Um, we asked people uh, not just how much time they spent abroad, but also how many friends from other cultures they have. So whether they have built these re had built these relationships. And we're going to look at uh, data from sensitivity. Here, respondents with many friends from other cultures. Uh, so those who already have friends from other cultures, they have already fairly high competence scores. That's a nice line. Now let's compare, so, so respondents who had never lived abroad have relatively high scores here, then up to six months it goes up a little, they spend up to a year abroad, nothing really happens, and then if you spend more than two years abroad, again you see that the competence scores go up. Those are the ones with many friends from other cultures. Let's look at the one with few friends from other cultures. So the orange line. Um, you see it's lower, which in this context just means they have lower scores, significantly lower scores than those with many friends from other cultures. But it seems to, you know, being abroad seems to help. After six months, you know, they have higher scores. And after one year abroad, the scores go up again. So here the question is, the two lines might actually meet. And I have six minutes and 55 seconds left, so I'm just going to click through. Um, they don't. <laughs> so when you have those students leaving after half a year or after one year, they might be at the top of their potential. And then they go back or they stay, whatever, you know, you just don't know what happens afterwards. They need to make friends. Um, the same here with managing uncertainty, pretty much the same, you know, the two lines never do they meet. And this is the interaction. On the one hand, yes, spending time abroad, you need to have been there. It's a certain challenge. It's fantastic. Um, but you need intercultural competencies to make something out of it, to make friends from other cultures. And if you have friends, if you build relationships, that again will build your intercultural competencies. The two are connected. In the end, culture is about meeting people, to quote uh, one of the great guys from the intercultural field, whose name I just can't remember right now. Uh, teamwork for the future is a now what? Five minutes, 51 seconds left. <laughs> teamwork for the future and probably what you will remember from this talk, you will forget everything except this Coca-Cola bottle. <laughs> and unfortunately it's not Coca-Cola Zero because Coca-Cola Zero expresses exactly the potential outcome of working together in diverse teams. Why? The first C stands for conflict. If you're in a team where diversity is high, your chances of ending up in unproductive conflict are vastly higher than if it's a monocultural team. Okay, that's the first C. The second chance is that your team somehow ruffles together and finds its way and then you're just as productive as any team, monocultural team. You don't outperform the team. It's the zero of Coca-Cola zero. And the second C is creativity. It's been shown that yes, culturally diverse teams have more creati creative, can have more creative results, can be better on innovation. So that's where the employers are keen to have people, people who can innovate. So that is really the key, that culture is a resource for creativity and innovation. And if your students, um, if you can help students to function in mixed teams in such a way that they can be creative, that they get the second C of Coca-Cola Zero, you've done a great job. What is your experience with your students? Do your students nicely mix and match like this? Hope you're not colorblind. No? Or is, does it rather look like this? Hands up if it's a bit more like this. Okay, okay, I can't see that one person who didn't raise the hand. No, but that is the same, whether you go to Australia or to Glasgow or whatever, you know, that is the key challenge. These students don't just mix because they're young and at university. 
um, they tend to sit together. The most extreme case was from a Chinese student in Australia who uh, wanted to mingle with the other Chinese students who spoke an, a different Chinese dialect. And she was pulled back by the Mandarin-speaking student and said, don't mingle with them, stay with us. Now you had a daring Chinese student. She was called back. Um, so uh, this is the key difficulty. When you look at 20 years of research onto diversity and team performance, if groups fall apart into subgroups, that's when diversity and differences become a problem. Then they become material for conflict. Differences as such are neutral. But if your team falls apart like this, then they become dynamite. If it's well mixed, they become the resource for creativity. So, what we've done, we've done some research also with the readiness check and we've connect, we correlated our competencies with two key measurements from this teamwork research. Uh, the first key message is if your team, regardless of composition, if everyone in the team is convinced and really kind of like deeply convinced that the differences in the team are essential for performance, that team will make it. And our competencies, too, in particular correlate with this, building commitment and managing uncertainty. Then, uh, if your team falls apart into subgroups, forget it. That's just tough, you know. That's your problem. And we have found that managing uncertainty, people with high scores on managing uncertainty, they don't suffer from this that much. Probably because they can take a bit of chaos and a bit of unpleasant social dynamics. They don't suffer so much from this subgroup dynam dynamic. So you, we can now use the readiness check, and we are starting to do this more systematically all the time, is we are using it, the assessment, to establish, to compose teams in a specific way, student teams. So we look at those scoring highest on managing uncertainty, and we split them across the teams. And we give them the specific assignment to use this competence to help the team overcome, deal with this negative social dynamic or prevent it from happening. Secondly, we look at those scoring highest on building commitment, the one that correlates with this attitude, diversity is great for our teams, our differences are fantastic. Again, we split them equally and we tell them to make the most out of this competence. And then we go to the classic intercultural competencies, sensitivity and communication, and again distribute the high scores equally across those, the teams. And again, tell them to deal with this. But also tell them, you, can, you, you may not be strong enough to, you know, you, you're good with picking up the differences, you're sensitive about this, you're interested. You need to become assertive in voicing your beliefs, in helping people talk about the differences. So these people also need to, to not just be sensitive, but also be able to voice their perceptions. So this is how you can use a competence assessment tool to see where people are already strong at. You can use this systematically to put your teams together, to create the right mix in your teams, um, and then to focus on coaching these teams these culturally diverse teams, both with international students and with local students, integrated, and to focus on how you can make this teamwork an experience within which they can build relationships, meaningful relationships with each other, enjoy succeeding together, um, and thereby develop their intercultural competencies. Um, in summary, um, yes, students, many good reasons for going abroad, even if intercultural competencies are not always <laughs> at the top on their radar. Um, if they learn to reflect about their experience in terms of these competencies, that already is a big step, a good uh, thing. Then there's a virtual circle. Competencies help them to build relationships, and relationships, again, help them to build competencies. Teamwork for the future. Every employer will, will be happy that you deliver students like that. Competence assessment can help you to skillfully compose your teams 
in line with these insights from the academic work on re research on teamwork and diversity. Um, and so that within their teams, these people can, and can build, build their networks, build relationships, have more chances to make friends across cultures. Okay, and Tax um, Karl Duha, thank you very much for all your work with getting the students ready, including somewhere my niece and my nephew. Thank you. <laughs> Fine, yes. <laughs> ah. Son? Yeah. Special yeah. <laughs> for Son? Any questions? Well, I. Oh, uh, pointing fingers? Pointing fingers. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting for the microphone, I'll read you a question from Daniel Hernandez. Daniel, where are you? That's Daniel. Or did you say Daniel? Daniel. Okay. Why don't all Norwegian universities uh, have a ma man mandatory class in intercultural competences to include the... This is really difficult for a, for a, a curic cur curriculum. Yeah, it's bigger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the well, curriculum, that, that, yeah, um, good, yeah, good idea, yes. Um, uh, tomorrow there is a, a workshop uh, by Marika Antikainen from the Metropolis University in Helsinki. Um, that is a university where it is compulsory, um, and, um, but it's also fun. So that's an exciting uh, example of, of what can be developed, yes, yeah. But absolutely, it's, uh, it's, it's a message, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, it's on. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Joachim Kallevik from the Norwegian Agency of Quality Assurance and Education. Uh, thank you very much for an uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, what do you think the role of social media is playing in here? Because now with young people living digitalized lives, uh, they don't interfere in, in physical space as they used to. Uh, countries, uh, national borders become more uh, less of a border because you live live online either way. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think that is going to uh, influence the interaction and the mixed teams? Because now you can go somewhere, study, and still live your regular social life through Facebook or Instagram and all these different digital tools. Thank you. Yeah, um, um, I don't, I'm not familiar with, sufficiently familiar with any kind of like empirical work on the effects of social media in this respect. So I can only talk from some anecdotes. I believe that uh, one, one tendency might be that um, without your smartphone, you would be faced, you, were, you would have been faced to really mingle with the locals. With your smartphones, you can stay at home socially. So that, would, that could be one effect that actually you keep contact with the home front to meet your personal and emotional needs. Um, and, you know, maybe are you less forced to, to actually interact with the, with the other people around you. So that is one of the, um, one of the effects that social media can have. Um, but um, I believe that it's... Um, I, I wonder whether simply the mere idea that we could be in touch with social media, with everyone on the planet, it's not, it's not sufficient. Something else needs to happen. Yeah. But again, you know, there that I, I, you know, I'd be interested in the real research there, uh, in addition to my personal thoughts and considerations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ursula. I think I've figured out what this actually is. I think it's a ski wax and clister for Norwegian cross-country skis. Really? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay, okay. You know, I did do cross-country. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. No, have we heard some gangers today? Stemmer it, as it is said, that international students are an underutnyttet resource in higher education? Sagt på en annen måte, er vi oss selv nok i hverdagen på norske utdanningsinstitusjoner? For å svare på dette har vi invitert Ragnhild Tungesvik, avdelingsdirektør for utredning og analyse i CU. Hun skal fortelle oss eh, hva vi faktisk vet om internasjonalisering og kvalitet i norsk høyere utdanning. 
I tillegg har vi invitert Ole Petter Ottersen, debattglad rektor ved Universitetet i Oslo, med egen blogg. Han har altså høyere utdanningssvar for Sofie Elise. Ta godt imot den. Ja, da er altså spørsmålet, er internasjonale studenter en underutnyttet ressurs i norsk høyere utdanning? Dette er et ledende spørsmål, og det har dessuten blitt besvart før i dag. Så det som jeg skal gjøre nå, det er å bidra med noe kunnskap som underbygger dette svaret når det gjelder norske studenter. Målet med denne korte presentasjonen min, det er å gi noen smaksbiter av tre undersøkelser som sier noe om samkvem mellom internasjonale studenter og vertslandets studenter. Det første er SIUs undersøkelse blant internasjonale studenter som er utgitt i denne rapporten International Students in Norway, Perceptions of Norway as a Study Destination. Det var dagens reklame, den har logget på infotorget. Og jeg finnes ellers på nettet. Så skal jeg ta frem litt fra studiebarometeret 2016 som NOKUT står bak. Og så si litt om en undersøkelse som NIFU har gjort blant norske gradstudenter i utlandet. Og den er utført på oppdrag fra en arbeidsgruppe som består av SIU, ANSA, NOKUT og enda noen flere. Internasjonalisering for alle. Dette er altså titelen som vi har hørt allerede på SIUs nye strategi. Og den målbærer også vår visjon at alle som er involvert i utdanning og opplæring skal erfare et internasjonalt læringsmiljø. Både de som reiser ut, de som blir hjemme og de som kommer til Norge. Med fokus på internasjonalisering for alle, så ønsker vi å tone ned skillet mellom mobilitet, utmobilitet og mobilitet på den ene siden, og internasjonalisering hjemme på den andre siden. Innholdet i visjonen ser vi, som Harald Lente tidligere i dag, frem til å fortsette å definere sammen med dere i årene som kommer. Men det er mye positivt som skjer nå, synes jeg, og som viser at mange deler denne visjonen med oss, inkludert utenfor politisk ledelse i Kunnskapsdepartementet. Når vi skal oppnå internasjonalisering for alle, så representerer internasjonale studenter en veldig viktig ressurs. Men er denne ressursen godt nok nytta på våre universitet og høgskoler? Jeg vil starte med denne påstanden. Internasjonale studenter i Norge oppnår sine mål. De får faglig relevant kunnskap, interkulturell kompetanse og internasjonale perspektiv og nettverk, uten at de norske studentene legger merke til det. Det er godt og vel 25 000 internasjonale studenter ved norske universiteter og høgskoler. I 2016 gjennomførte SIU altså for femte gang en spørreundersøkelse blant disse studentene. Undersøkingen var gjennomført i nært og godt samarbeid med dere som kommer fra institusjonene. Og i 2016-versjonen så deltok hele 22 institusjoner. Dere har også fått egne resultat på institusjonsnivå som dere kan bruke til å jobbe videre med ulike typer spørsmål knyttet til de internasjonale studentene. En sentral tanke og et mål knyttet til internasjonal studentmobilitet til Norge er at internasjonale studenter bidrar til øka internasjonalisering og dermed til å heve kvaliteten i norsk høyere utdanning. Problemstillingen er altså ikke at de internasjonale studentene har et problem, selv om de også godt kunne tenke seg mer kontakt med norske studenter, men at de norske studentene går glipp av noe flott som skjer på en campus nær dem. På hva måte bidrar så internasjonale studenter til å øke kvalitet i utdanning? Jeg vil nevne noen stikker her, men lista kan selvfølgelig gjøres lenger, og det er mye arbeid, godt arbeid som er gjort for å påpeke dette. For det første, internasjonale studenter beriker studiemiljøet, tilfører kunnskap og nye perspektiv til sine medstudenter, og er en ressurs for norsk næringsliv og resten av samfunnet, både mens de studerer og eventuelt når de er ferdige. Internasjonale studenter er for det andre som oftest veldig motiverte studenter. På samme måte som vi antar at norske studenter som reiser ut har høy motivasjon både for å studere og for å reise ut. For det tredje så har norske studenter som ikke selv reiser ut, de trenger også internasjonale erfaringer. Gjennom kontakt med internasjonale studenter kan de inngå i et internasjonalt læringsmiljø 
Träna sig i språk, få nya kulturella impulser och få insikt i andra måter och se samhället vårt och världen på. Och för det fjärde så ska alla norska studenter och ut i en arbetsmarknad som ett arbetsmarknad som blir stadig mer globaliserat. Uansett yrke vill de möta människor från andra land i en rekke olika sammanhang som kunder, som samarbetspartner, patienter, elever och kollegor. I undersökelsen vår så visade resultaten att de internationella studenterna i Norge i stor grad är er tillfreds med studierna sina. Mer än 70 procent var förnöjda med undervisningen och hela 62 procent av gradstudenterna vurderade att bli i Norge efter avslutade studier. Men på frågan om vad internationella studenter uppfattar som mer utmanande än förvänta, så får faktorn bli känt med normen höga skor samman med höga levekostnader. Data från undersökelsen visar att internationella studenter tillbringar allra mest tid samman med andra internationella studenter. De tillbringar minst tid samman med norska studenter. 29 procent av respondenterna i undersökelsen säger att de sällan eller aldrig har kontakt med norska studenter på studiestaden. Bara 23 procent svarar att de har daglig kontakt med norska studenter. Och 46 procent anslår att de har kontakt med norska studenter en gång i månaden eller sällanare. Talar för socialisering med norska studenter på fritid och ändå svagare. 34 procent svarar att de sällan eller aldrig är er samman med norska studenter på fritid. Och här är er det själva att det sammanhang det med ser är er att de som har mest kontakt med norrmän i studiesammanhang inte överraskande också har hyppigare samvär med norska studenter på fritid. Detta är er alltså vad de internationella studenterna säger om tingens tillstånd. Vad vet med så om hur de norska studenterna ser på detta? En viss indikation på detta fick med i studiebarometer för 2016. Nokut inlämnar frågor om internationalisering eh, i sista versionen av studiebarometer och det ger ett sammanlikningsgrundlag för vår undersökelse bland internationella studenter i Norge. Här har man med andra ord två olika blick representerat, de internationella studenternas sitt blick och alla studenter av norska institutioner sitt blick. Om ska se jag ska säga si väldigt kort om de resultaten. Resultaten på fra studiebarometer bekräftar långt på väg våra fund som visar att internationella studenter i stor grad är er ut är en unnytta eller underutnyttja läringsresurs i norsk utbildning. Omfanget av vet inte som ett svar som svar är er högre på påståenden internationella studenter berikar det fagliga miljö på studieprogrammet än för de allra flesta av de andra påståendena i, I undersökelsen. I rapporten sin så menar Nokut att detta er sannsynligtvis skyllas att många studenter rätt och slett inte har någon erfaring med internationella studenter. Detta är er en indikation som samsvarar med våra fund av lite kontakt mellan dessa två grupperna. Studiebarometer visar att masterstudenter värderar omfång av internationalisering högre än bachelorstudenter och att de i större grad upplever att internationella studenter faktiskt berikar det fagliga miljöet. Detta visar också att det i särskild grad är er en stor jobb att göra på studieprogram på lägre grad för att nå ambitionen om att internationalisering ska höja kvaliteten i hela utbildningsloppet och träffa alla studenter. Är er detta så ett särnorsk fenomen? Är er det oss kalla och lucka normen detta handlar om? Är er det fördi vår form för höflighet går ut på alla andra vara i fred, slik forskar Kristin Rygg ved NHH hävdar i en nylig utgitt publikation? Nej, och i internationell forskning så är er det känt att internationella studenter har relativt lite kontakt med världslandens sina studenter och relativt sett mer kontakt med andra internationella studenter. De mest internationella bland oss norrmän må väl vara de studenterna som reiser ut för att ta en hel grad. Som jag nämnde så, så har ni för nettop genomfört en undersökning bland de norska studenterna som tar en full grad i utlandet och det innehåller faktiskt några av de samma frågor som vi hade eh, i vår undersökelse bland de internationella studenterna. Här är er det en graf som sammanlignar samkväm mellan internationella gradstudenter och världsinstitutionsstudenter i och utanför Norge. De gröna sölen är norska gradstudenter i utlandet och de grå är er internationella gradstudenter i Norge. Vad visar så denna graf, dessa grafer oss? När det gäller nordiska land och brittiska öar så är er samvär och samkväm mellan eh, internationella studenter i Norge och norska i dessa länder nog så likt. Men när det kommer till Nordamerika så är er det så att 90 procent av norska studenter som studerar i Nordamerika har god kontakt med med, student, med amerikanska studenter men bara 70 procent av studenterna från Nordamerika har jämlik kontakt med norska studenter. Här borde ju inte en ting som språk för exempel vara något väldigt stort hinder. 
For Australia og New Zealand er det enda større forskjell. Bare 57 prosent av de som er i Norge sier at de har jevnlig kontakt med norske studenter. Og også for andre land, som det står her, som omfatter både Afrika, Asia og Latinamerika, er det langt flere norske studenter som studerer ute som har kontakt med verdslandet sine studenter. En tilfelle er for internasjonale studenter fra de samme landene i Norge. Hvordan har det blitt slik? Hva kan vi gjøre med det, og hvem sitt ansvar er det? Nyere forskning peker i retning av at det er det at internasjonale studenter er til stede ved utdanningsinstitusjonene ikke er tilstrekkelig for å utvikle et internasjonalt læringsmiljø for alle studenter, norske så vel som internasjonale. Vi kan altså ikke være fornøyd med oss selv og tenke at institusjonen vår er så og så internasjonal bare fordi statistikken viser en viss prosentdel internasjonale studenter. Et spørsmål som i økende grad gjør seg gjeldende både nasjonalt og internasjonalt er i hva grad utdanningsinstitusjonene makter å organisere undervisning, bussetting og sosiale aktiviteter på måter som skaper et internasjonalt læringsmiljø. Å være på samme campus er ikke nok. Å være i samme auditorium er heller ikke tilstrekkelig. Organiseringen må gå djupere enn dette. Jannike Virs Jensen, som er i salen her og skal være med i debatten etterpå, presenterte mange gode ideer til dette i sin artikkel i Krono for et par veker siden. Den anbefaler jeg, og som sagt, Jannike får anledning til å si mer om det etterpå. Jeg skal ikke gjenta poengene fra denne artikkelen, men jeg skal heller fokusere på forslag i samme retning som de Jannike kommer med, som de internasjonale studentene selv kom med i de åpne spørsmålene i vår undersøkelse. Vi ba om forslag til hva institusjonene kan gjøre annerledes for å bedre kontakten mellom internasjonale og norske studenter. Svar og avsløre hvor studentene synes at skoen trykker med hensyn til undervisning, studieliv, busituasjon og fritid. Og nå skjedde det et eller annet her. Noen av kommentarene fra undersøkelsen viser at måten undervisningen er lagt opp på ikke legger til rette for at studentene har kontakt og samarbeid med norske studenter, og at dette blir etterlyst. Er det slik at de internasjonale studentene stort sett går på studieprogrammet på kurs der flertallet er internasjonale studenter, og om de går på samme program eller kurs som norske studenter, hvordan blir da undervisningen, grupper, praksis, eksamen organisert? En del av kommentarene viser at mange opplever studentlivet som åpent i prinsippet, men ikke så tilgjengelig i praksis. Dette går både på informasjon på engelsk og på en inviterende holdning overfor internasjonale studenter fra studentorganisasjonene. Flere av oss har sikkert nå i dag lest Dassavisen, som henger rundt omkring her på denne institusjonen. Det la jeg merke til at det var et international corner nære til høyre, men der var det en helt annen informasjon enn den som sto på norsk for øvrig på dette avisoppslaget. Så det var jo et lite eksempel på dette, at informasjonen ikke er så lett tilgjengelig. Men også institusjonene sin organisering av separate introduksjonsarrangement for norske og internasjonale studenter blir trekt frem av studentene som en tapt integrasjonsmulighet. Det etterlyses også oppfølging med sosiale arrangement ute ved semestere som kan legge til rette for sosial kontakt mellom ulike studentgrupper. Flere av kommentarene går også på plassering av internasjonale studenter for seg i studentboliger. Det er for få norske studenter som blir plassert sammen med de internasjonale studentene i bymiljøet. Dette er sannsynligvis praktiske årsaker, men er det likevel mulig å tenke nytt om dette for å øke mulighetene for bekjennskap? Også i studiebarometeret så var det åpne spørsmål knyttet til internasjonalisering. Jeg vil avslutte med noen perspektiv fra norske studenter som har opplevd at internasjonale studenter beriker deres egen studiekvardag, uten å stikke om den stol at det også var andre svar i denne undersøkelsen med annen valør. For å nytte den uvurderlige ressursen som internasjonale studenter er, for å øke kvaliteten i norsk høyere utdanning, er det nødvendig å se på organiseringen av studietilbudene, med mål om å øke kontaktflatene og utvikle samværsformene mellom norske studenter og internasjonale studenter. Hvorledes dette skal gjøres, og hvem som har og tar ansvaret, den utfordringen sender jeg videre til rektor ved Universitetet i Oslo, Ole Petter Ottersen, og til debattpanelet etter pausen. Takk for meg.
Ja, god ettermiddag alle sammen. Katrine, hvor er du? Takk for introduksjonen. Første gang jeg er blitt introdusert på den måten, og jeg måtte jo da gå til kilden. Det skal vi alle gjøre som akademikere. Her har vi Sofie Elises blogg. Jeg rakk bare å komme hjem, gå på do, sove litt, pakke opp og pakke ned igjen, før jeg alltid en gang sitter på gardemoen. Denne gang går reisen mot nord. Jeg vil passe på å bruke tid med søsteren min før hun flytter til New Zealand. Hun skal nemlig på utveksling. Og hun... Hun, hun har startet en blogg om utvekslingsåret sitt, som dere finner her. Katrine, du traff nesten. Du skulle ha henvist til hennes søster. Men det som er flott er, hva skriver hun om søsteren sin? Min tøffe søster. Og der er vi allerede ved kjernepunktet. Når det gjelder studenter som skal reise ut, de må være litt tøffe. Og vi må som lærere, inspirere dem til å være tøffe. Men vi skal stort sett snakke om internasjonale studenter som kommer hit, og hva som skjer med dem, og hva vi skal gjøre for å oppnå det som de to foredragsvånerne er skjønt enige om. Det er et eller annet med kontakten mellom de som kommer inn og våre egne studenter. Det er der vi kan bli mye bedre. Jeg vil avslutte med noe av det vi gjør på UiO, i den troen at vi kan også gjøre vi er bedre på akkurat det området. Og vi har ikke så mye å skryte av hvis vi ser tilbake på historien. Fantastisk hva som skjedde med den første utvekslingsstudenten som kom til Norden. Det var da René Descartes. Det var i 1649. Han kom til Queen Christina. Fantastisk biografi. Når hun forteller om hvor fantastisk flott det var å få, ikke denne studenten da, men denne filosofen på besøk. Dette var internasjonalisering et haum altså i det svenske hoff. Men han ble ikke spesielt godt integrert. Han måtte da gå til Queen Christina midt på vinteren klokken fem om morgenen. Det var da den integrasjonen begynte. Og han skriver i januar 1650, det er et fantastisk brev. Han skriver til sine kolleger hjemme og sier at «Man's thoughts are frozen here, just like the water». Og poenget var, han døde av, antagelig var det pneumoni, altså lungebetegnelse, i februar 1650, bare noen måneder etter han kom. Det var en dårlig start, dere. Og det betyr at vi har et stort forbedringspotensial for å ta bedre vare på de som kommer inn. Og debatten skal vi ikke gå veldig mye gjennom. Så hva skjedde nå? Nå falt alt ut. Nei, det er et eller annet som skjer. Den er sein, denne her. Hopper fra den ene til den andre. Hva er det som skjer? Vi skal tilbake til slide nummer to. Den, ja. Debatten! Nei, jo, nei, jo, nei. Er det du som styrer, jeg som styrer? Dette er helt mystisk. Kan du være så snill av den stå, den som styrer dette? Vi har jo hatt en besyndelig debatt i dette landet, synes jeg, rundt kostnadene såkalt ved internasjonalisering, og ikke minst hva det koster å ta imot studenter som kommer hit uten skolepenger. Og jeg bare henstiller til alle som deltar i denne debatten og ser på forskningen rundt dette. Og her har vi to forskjellige rapporter som er referert til hva det gir oss som nasjon å ta imot internasjonale studenter. Hvis man er så sofistikert at man ikke bare ser på den økonomiske bunnlinjen der og da, men også trekker inn alle de forskjellige positive, jeg vil kalle det bivirkningen, ikke misforstå, av det å ta imot studenter fra utlandet. Det gir oss som nasjon en enorm gevinst, og det er det som er tydelig gjort her. Ikke minst gir det oss en gevinst ved at vi skaffer oss et mye bredere kontaktnett, både som nasjon og som enkeltindivider. Vi trekker ikke bare disse studenter som har vært her tilbake hit, kanskje, men også deres familier, man øker turismen, man skaper i det hele tatt et helt annet land ved å være generøs overfor studenter fra utlandet. Og derfor så er det litt merkelig at vi nå på søndag fikk et referat fra Høyres landsmøte, hvor det altså da 
Nå i programmet kommer det til å stå altså at man skal innføre moderate skolepenger for studenter fra utenfor EØS. Samtidig skal gratisprinsippet videreføres. Det har jeg prøvd å finne ut av hvordan de er harmonerer. Det har jeg ikke klart forløpig. Gevinsen er stor, og vi må passe på at vi ser på alle de positive ringvirkningene det er ved å ta imot studenter fra utlandet. Nå er det spennende hva som skjer her. Jeg har ikke studert, jeg har ikke demonstrert på campus siden 70-tallet, før nå nettopp, og det var jo nettopp da for å markere en motstand mot innføring av skolepenger, og det forrige forsvei i 2015 var det vel. Jeg ble da veldig kritisert fordi at hodet var for stort. Det er også veldig viktig, selvsagt, og etter mitt syn, å være veldig mot at man skal sile studenter som kommer fra utlandet. Bare ta imot de som da passer inn i dagens næringsliv. Det er å konservere dagens næringsliv, etter mitt syn. Her er det en diskusjon med NHO i Dagsnytt 18 om dette. Han kan ikke nå argumentere imot meg, men altså diskusjonen gikk nettopp på det. Skal man faktisk sile studenter som kommer inn? Og mitt svar er at vi forstater da. Nei, det blir ikke absolutt å konservere og samarbeide med oss. Ja, så har vi da denne rapporten. Internasjonale studenter er vel nøgd med utdanning i Norge. Flott rapport, den sier mye om det vi burde gjøre, og skal gjøre, og faktisk allerede gjør. Og vi skal ikke se på det som er positivt, vi skal selvsagt som gode akademikere fokusere på det som da er negativt, og det vi kan gjøre noe med. Men det er jo litt morsomt da at vi tross alt hevder oss relativt bra, den her skal gå fort over. Hvis vi ser på Norge, og man kan si mye rart om metodikken, men akkurat denne undersøkelsen sier jo da at vi i Norge ikke gjør det så aller verst tross alt når det gjelder det å ta imot studenter, altså International Student Satisfaction Awards. Masse å si om metodikken, men vi skårer i hvert fall bedre enn Irland, det skulle jo være mange. Da har vi Oslo, og bare for en liten stund siden så kom det også en QS-ranking om de beste studentbyene. Jeg synes jo Oslo har noe å være fornøyd med. Vi er nummer 53 i verden ifølge denne studenten. Undersøkelsen, Stockholm, København er de byene i Norden som ligger foran oss. Men hvis man ser på den undersøkelsen, som er i hvert fall antydningsvis seriøs, så er vi i hvert fall ikke på bunnen av listen. Og så kan man si at her er det en cut-off med tanke på hvor store byene er som da inkluderer. Og det er noe du står negativt ut for. En by som heter Trondheim, for eksempel. Nå ser jeg hvor er det jeg snakker med denne herren da, sånn. Er det den neste? Ok. Dette er jo den store utfordringen, og det er jo rørende enighet at det er denne kontakten det dreier seg om, eller manglende kontakten det dreier seg om. Og jeg må jo si at de tallene, de er jo, unnskyld at jeg sier det, de er nesten sjokkerende. 29 prosent melder at det er sjeldent eller aldri samhandler med norske studenter. Hvis det er riktig, og vi må jo tro at det er riktig, så det er ikke bare det at vi har en utfordring, vi har en gedigen utfordring. Jeg har selv vært utvekslingsstudent, eller dro til Paris når jeg var 22 år gammel. Det var ikke uten barrierer som måtte overstiges. Men jeg tenker bare på hvis jeg skulle vært blant de 29 prosentene som ikke samlet med franske studenter. Altså det er nesten... Her er det et eller annet som vi virkelig må ta fatt i. Og her står jo det litt annen fasong, men også andre kilder støtter jo, som allerede har vært sagt, opp imot dette at interaksjonen mellom innkommende studenter og norske studenter er for dårlig. Så her må vi da tydeligvis gjøre mye. Det at vi må være en slik kontakt er jo så avgjørende. Det dreier seg rett og slett om å få de perspektivene som trengs for våre norske studenter for at de skal få kvalitet til sin utdanning. Og det gjelder også at de som kommer inn selvsagt får bygget de nettverkene som de vil profitere på resten av livet. Jeg profiterer hver dag selv på de nettverkene bygget i Paris på søkken. Og jeg kan ikke begripe at ikke utveksling verdsettes høyere den dag i dag. Og at ikke våre egne lærere oppmuntrer mer til utveksling enn det de gjør i dag. Med fare for å være litt selvkritisk. 
Så hva gjør vi da for å prøve å øke denne interaksjonen, styrke interaksjonen? Og jeg sier ikke at vi har funnet den endelige oppskriften på noe som helst, men det jeg tør påstå er at vi har snudd litt opp ned på tenkningen over de siste årene rundt hvordan vi skal ta vare på de internasjonale studentene. Altså det er ikke noe sånn pampering og segregation, altså pampering fører ofte til segregation, at du kjører spesifikke løp for de internasjonale studentene som kommer inn, i den troen at det er det som vil virke mest generøst. Hvert imot så har vi nå snudd på det, slik at de aller fleste tiltakene vi gjør, de gjør vi jo da, naturlig nok, både for de norske og internasjonale studentene samtidig. I den troen at dette vil styrke interaksjonen mellom våre egne studenter, norske studenter og de internasjonale. Og eh, før så var det jo separate buddy systems, nå er det jo kun ett buddy system som gjør at de samme buddyene tar imot de internasjonale studentene som de norske, og sørger for da, naturlig nok, at det blir en tettere interaksjon mellom de forskjellige studentene. Vi har skikurs, det klistret tror jeg at kom fra et av våre skikurs, det som ble utgitt som gav i sted. Vi har språkkafé, vi har hytteturer, vi har i hele tatt en rekke tiltak hvor vi er veldig bevisst på at dette skal ikke føre til segregering, det skal være både norske og internasjonale studenter sammen. Og det er jo den type tenkning som på sikt må appliseres generelt for å styrke denne interaksjonen som vi aldri nå har opptatt av. Så her har vi jo da igjen det som er det aller, aller viktigste som jeg tror vi er enige om vi må gjøre. Det er denne samhandlingen, interaksjonen vi må bli mye viktigere. Så er da spørsmålet, og her har vi målkonflikt. Jeg personlig kritiseres hver eneste høst i universitas, selv sagt, for at vi flyr alt for mye, altså dette klima, alt for viktig, kode, alt for viktig. Her har vi en typisk målkonflikt. Flyreisene på UIO går bare en vei, og det er oppover. Ja, det gjør jo de fleste flyreiser for så vidt. Men nå tenkte jeg da statistisk. Og spørsmålet er, er det noen flere kreative måter vi kan bruke for å takle denne målkonflikten? Og noe av det som jeg tror en representant for iPad er til stede her i dag, er jo rett og slett å utnytte digitale hjelpemidler mye, mye mer kreativt. Det som er dessverre saken er at long distance learning og undervisning gjennom nettet ofte er enveis. Det ser vi veldig mange eksempler på, men hvorfor trenger vi å ha enveis undervisning gjennom nettet? Man kan jo ha to klasserom, to forskjellige land med dobbelt sett lærere, og så kan man rett og slett via nettet integrere de to klasserommene og integrere også undervisningen, slik at begge klasserom føler at de er på samme campus. Det er fullt mulig, og det er noe som iPad har fått til veldig godt, synes jeg, gjennom dette initiativet med University of Iowa. Så internationalization at home betyr ikke nødvendigvis at man kun relaterer seg til de som er fløyet inn fra utlandet, men man kan lage felles læringsarenaer gjennom nettet. Og det samme argumentet gjelder også motsatt vei. Ja, dette bekymrer meg veldig, jeg våknet om natten faktisk når denne undersøkelsen kom, og tenkte på, kan dette være korrekt? Dette er altså NIFUs arbeidsgiverundersøkelse. Det er vel vi som bestilte den hos NIFU, og dere kjenner sikkert til den. Og den sier litt om hva arbeidsgiverne setter pris på hos studenter, eller kandidater da. Og her sier dere, utenlandsopphold kommer altså på syvende plass av syv kriterier. Og hvorfor? Jeg vet ikke hvorfor. Nå kan man si mye om metode, om spørsmålstilling og så videre. Men jeg tror at vi ikke bare skal jobbe med våre egne institusjoner. Vi må prøve å få også arbeidslivet til å innse hvilken verdi det har å ta imot personer som har i perspektivene det å ha vært før sammen eller komme før sammen. Og her har vi et eksempel på en person som ikke føler han blir verdsatt av arbeidslivet. Han har stått fram i NRK. Fantastisk bakgrunn. Og føler at det er veldig vanskelig å få innpass på arbeidslivet. Så vi kan ikke bare se på oss selv. Vi må også se på samme mulighet for hvordan vi verdsetter perspektivrikdommene her ved å ha mennesker med forskjellig bakgrunn. Og det var det jeg tenkte å si. Well, 
we'll read today's final session a debate on the international campus. How can it become more inclusive and contribute to increased quality in Norwegian higher education? The moderator for the debate is Doug Stenwall, a senior advisor at CU. In the early 90s, he moved from his hometown Tromsø to study in Bergen, where he has ever since tried to be included among the natives. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is all yours, Doug. Thank you, Christina. Christina. Uh, don't leave, please, before you have your, uh, your gift. You already <gasps> have your hug. Uh, but first, I want you to answer some questions. <laughs> And, uh, thank you for doing a wonderful job as a, as a chair today, and it will be a little difficult to take over after you. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad it was so to find out what it is. Yes, I guess there are some uh, affinities between national mobility and international. I, I still only have friends from outside Bergen, even after 25 years in Bergen, so it is difficult <laughs> to integrate. Um, Okay, so we're going to the, the debate, and uh, we've been talking a lot about mobility the other way around, and the theme of the debate is the international campus. How can it become more inclusive and contribute to increased quality in Norwegian higher education? Uh, the idea behind this panel is to embrace five different characters in this area. So we have, um, you can just come, all come up on the scene and sit down, and I'll introduce you first, and then you'll all have your five minutes each for introductions. First, we have the Norwegian student. Christina de uh, Svensrud uh, is uh, from the uh, um, Norwegian Student Organization, International Responsible. Uh, if you looked at the film earlier, she had this caption uh, uh, rolling that said, uh, you have X number of international students on your campus, so what? Isn't that a great uh, title for uh, such a, uh, um, a debate? Uh, our second participant is the international student. So here we have these uh, represented as well. And uh, originally, actually, it was uh, Henry Muteve was going to be here, but unfortunately, yesterday he had to cancel due to uh, private reasons. And uh, very, very uh, big thanks to um, uh, Fatula Oran to step in at very short notice. Fatula is a master degree student at the Norwegian School of Theology, so Menes um, Fakultete. He is responsible for international affairs at the student councils there. And he told me just before that he, uh, he was born in Turkey, he was raised in Romania, he's been studying in Albania, and now he's here. <laughs> so, uh, a true uh, internationalist. Third participant, uh, the researcher of international, uh, internationalization. Janneke Wies Jansen from uh, High School Norsk Orthodox has been, uh, for decades, been doing research on internationalization in particular, and also education more generally. Uh, her quote at the film earlier was, many Norwegian higher education institutions have a strong focus on raising student mobility, but not always a clear idea of why. It's a good point. Fourth um, participant, fourth character, the teaching professor. And this is Birgit Svihus, who is professor of bioscience at Norwegian University of Life Sciences. And I googled Birger, one of the first articles I found was, how to lose weight without getting hungry as a wolf. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was a bit funny, actually, because the, the wolf debate lately has been about the, the wolves from Sweden migrating into Norway. <laughs> and as you probably know, the, the largest group of international students in Norway are actually Swedes. So there is a <laughs> parallel. I'm looking forward to hearing the, the parallel between the wolves and the Swedish students. Last but not least, uh, the rector and master blogger, uh, Ole Petter Ottersen. <laughs> Um, well known as a strong supporter of internationalization, as you know, and uh, it's actually so strong that uh, lately he's been looking for work abroad. So, um, <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to all of you. Um, each participant will have a uh, five minutes uh, opening speech in the order I said, and um, um, I, will, I will stand up from the chair over there when your time is up, and then you can take a deep breath and talk until you're out of breath. So. That's, that means we finish. And then after, we'll have about half an hour plus for um, some discussion and debate in between you and some more questions also from, the, from you guys. So please use the, the Twitter account also for this session as you've been doing earlier today. So please, first, Christina, your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is this on? Yes, okay, thank you. And thank you have to keep it really close to your mouth, even really if it looks close. a bit 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Looks a bit what? I don't get it. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is really interesting and I'm really excited to be a part of this panel. And also, when I heard first that Henry wasn't going to make it, I was like, okay, so we're sitting and discussing how to include international students without international students. What a Norwegian thing to do. <laughs> uh, and this is also the first time we have students here, not only talking about them, but with them and to them. So this is great. So uh, some of the comments or remarks I would like to say is that uh, internationalization starts with including international students. That is the way we can create the global learning environment that we strive to do. And also the question to include internationalization has international students has been ongoing for decades. And if I had the clear answer, I don't think I would be here. I would probably make a lot more money as well. <laughs> so I don't have the clear answer, but I think we can come up with some good solutions on this debate. Um, as we all know in this room, of course, preaching to the choir, is that diversity of students and also the students' viewpoints is a cornerstone of global education. And that's why it's so important that we also include them in our classrooms and in our learning environment, both socially and academically. So as we have been told today, there is a troubling evidence that there is a lack of inclusion between the international and domestic students and also that the international students feel really isolated from the university community, and also that they have a lot of difficulties making <laughs> friends with domestic <laughs> students. So we saw that in CU's report, and also from Studiebarometer. And also I would like to uh, comment a little bit about my quote that, so you have ex-international students and so what? And that is actually not my quote, so I'm not going to take the honor from it, but it's from Darla Derdov from another panel debate. And that clearly states that mobility itself is not enough. There are some correlation between uh, the Norwegian student that daily face international students and how they see them as an added value, but also the questions that would, uh, uh, that would be asked in Studiemarbetre clearly show that there is also a long way to go before we can call ourselves a globalized uh, country in higher education. So I think we need, as the debate also says, that we need some structure. So I'm really curious about the university and uh, higher education institutions point of view here today. What can we do? What can the institutions do? Because the students, both domestic and international students, says that most of the, the responsibility to make an inclusive environment is the higher education institutions. And not only on the higher level, but also at faculty level and lower on. Mm. So we need to have holistic strategies and it needs to be based on what the students' actual needs are. There, there might be different needs for Norwegian domestic students and there might be different needs for international students in different fields. So also I'm really glad that we have an international student here and I'm really happy to hear what he has to say about how it is to be an international student in Norway because I have never been one and neither have the rest of us. So this will be really interesting. Um, so, and also I would like to comment that to create some national strategies, it's not a one size fits all. We need to have the students present and we need to have them, their voices heard when we do that. And we need to not make one national strategy and say this is enough, this makes it work. Like we have to have local, uh, local p points of view as well. And I think one way that we can actually make it work is that we have clear goals, clear targets and also a timeline. We need to have a clear goal and vision of what we're actually doing. So with the right mix of support from the university and the engagement of faculty and staff and domestic and international students, I think that international students have a much greater chance on reaching the academic and personal goals from coming to Norway and study. Thank you, Christina. That was even within time. So please, first of all. Hello. I hope you all can hear me. I don't like to use microphone, neither writings, but how nice me starting with stuff that I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Fethullah Oran. I'm originally Turkish, born in Turkey, raised up in Romania, primary, secondary in Romania. Then for a bachelor degree, I went 
to Albania, Tirana, the capital. Studied there for three years, and then for a summer holiday, I came to Norway. I don't know why I chose Norway in summer, but <laughs> I came to Norway. And then I ended up at MF. I am the first international answerly, some Norwegian words, <laughs> at MF, and one of the few ones in Norway, as far as I spoke with my friends and I know that. And at MF, like, they really did a good job for me being, I don't like this word, integrated, but accepting me from one of them, because we have learning milieu at Volk, and international at Volk, and all student council meetings are held in English right now. Even though there are other members are totally, totally Norwegians, and I'm the only one who's English speaking, student, and they're changing their Norwegian, their mother tongue, into English and speaking in English. Step by step, our documents are being translated into English as well. And I guess like this is actually the experiencing or how it feels like being included to the Norwegian society. They could choose to speak in Norwegian, which I would totally understand, but our rector, our director, or our leaders speaking in English it makes me feel special a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll be saying a couple of events that what we did with international students, and a couple of points that I want to make all you aware of. You know, we have coffee hours at MF every in once in every two weeks, which international students and Norwegian students come along, which international students talk about their culture and Norwegians do, but only a couple of them. And integration, again, I need to use this word, which I don't like, happening there. The panel is, has a really wonderful timing because we are having a culture week right now at MF, which started on Monday, continues until Friday. Very intense week with cultural events. We had the food fair, which I know everyone loves food, and it was free, which students love it. And uh, yesterday we had a panel, which I was called in last minute as well, <laughs> about religious minorities. Uh, <laughs> and then today we are having international service as well, because it's theology school, you all might know. And tomorrow we have some African cultural dance courses. You all are invited if you want to come. <laughs> if you want to see some African students dancing with Norwegians, it will be good. Diversity, including internationals speaking in English in the meetings or translating documents. This does not remove something from the Norwegian cultural identity, which I believe and I heard that some of the Norwegians think that it will remove something from the diversity and the culture. But Norwegian is first. No opposition comment for this. I get it. I understand. But imagine when everything goes in Norwegian, we international students don't think that we are included in this. You go to a meeting with nine wonderful people speaking in Norwegian, which you don't understand anything, a couple of words. And I'm asking you all, can this be being included into the society or into the group? Which I assume everyone will say no. And then, like, it's more rounded education when you have different opinions. We need willing people, role models, to communicate the positive values of international students. Which, I'm gonna say something I guess Norwegians won't like, but world is much bigger than Norway. We need to accept that. <laughs> <laughs> like, the international students need to be represented accurately. Like, me being there, I know how, what is to struggle with UDI. I know how, like, what is the struggle to find that 106,000 kroners, there's another numbers, three, four, eight, two, I guess, 106,000, four, eight, two. Mm -hmm. You need to find that every year for your renewal. You need to make an appointment. First, after the appointment, you need to open a bank account, which they say takes three to five weeks, but it doesn't. A couple of months, at least, like, my friend, three to four months, I did spent six months opening a bank account. <coughs> I'm not like judging anything, but these are the struggles. 
MF, one-fourth is international students, approximately, and UIO is one-fifth of the students are internationals. And this is really a big percentage of the students. As I said, like, Norwegians can represent the international students. I totally agree with that. But they won't be satisfied. Norwegians think that they understand the international <coughs> students, but they don't. To be honest, they don't. And like me, because I know myself, I'm in this position for the first time at MF, and from the feedbacks, I see that it's working. That's why, why don't we encourage the international students to become more in the student parliaments? <coughs> international Aswali, it's a really good position for that. Running for a leader sounds really exciting, more fun, but you need to go step by step. As like, there are a lot of professors here, <laughs> there are a lot of professors here, which you all need to encourage. Our rector needs to encourage, because people might be shy in this kind of stuff, but if you push a little bit, then step by step, everything comes. And posters, everywhere it's written in Norwegian. 45 more seconds, I guess. It's in Norwegian. A couple of like, like sentences being written in English really feels really happy. Oh, I can understand this poster. I can go to this event. I won't be excluded from this. And my leader in the student council really helped me a lot. Her name is Fum. I don't know if she is here. And like she fought for me in other meetings and to open a new position. It was a new position. And I really thank her. And before coming here, I talked with our rector. I want to quote a couple of sentences. Only funny for, words, yes. Yeah, funny words. <clears throat> it's important to see international students which make and improve the quality of both education and social life of all students. Not only working class, but when international students start to become more socially inclusive and engaged in other topics, that is the important step to become more an international campus. I thank Mr. Vidar quoting this, and sorry for taking your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Petula. I was thinking also, it must be really nice to you to actually be in a room with a Norwegian student for once. I mean, it's like a <laughs> fantastic experience. Um, third speaker is Janneke Wies Jensen. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, we know that the number of international students in Norway has grown a lot during recent years. And this is a development that is intended because internationalization is very high on the agenda of, uh, of Norwegian higher education policy. Uh, the main rationale uh, for encouraging and facilitating mobility is uh, it rests on an assumption that uh, mobility will enhance quality in Norwegian higher education. This is particularly striking in the government policy, but also in the strategies of the institutions. However, there is actually quite uh, the empirical evidence for this link is quite weak and, uh, and, uh, and in many of these strategies and in the policy uh, it's not really defined how internationalization and mobility is supposed to enhance quality. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there is not a link. I mean, I can think of at least two ways that this can happen. And one is that the, the, that the institutions attract particularly talented students that will sort of um, uh, contribute to making the education more excellent uh, with these, these students. But also, uh, what we have been talking more about today is that the international students, they represent uh, different perspectives, they have different, different experiences, and that the Norwegian students also can take advantage from and learn from the international students. So, so, but for both these things to happen, we need interaction, and as we have discussed today already, uh, the interaction is limited, so we need to do something. Uh, because, well, first of all, the international students, they miss out on something, uh, an important aspect of being an international student, if they don't get to know the Norwegian students. But on the other hand, the international students, they also form other networks, and they're quite satisfied. So maybe the loss is not biggest for them, but for the Norwegian students and the Norwegian higher education institutions because the, the, the absence of interaction is not in line with the policy goals 
and 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 we need to 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 use the experiences that the international can contribute with. So, what can we do? Well, I think first of all, there's this need to focus more for some of the institutions on on quality rather than quantity. We always hear that oh, we need to raise the number of international students. But why do we need this and how can we we uh, obtain uh, in the goals that we set. I think it's, it's um, a need for focusing on that. And I think that if we want more interaction, we need to do some, at least reflect on some organizational and maybe it's also some pedagogical ch um, changes. I think first of all, the international students and the Norwegian students need to be in the same courses. Otherwise, I mean, it's not easy to have interaction if you don't see each other. The second thing is also maybe we have to think about uh, how we organize uh, uh, the teaching, because we need maybe more interactive teaching to, to, uh, to use the skills that the international students can contribute with, learning activities that encourages cooperation between students. And also maybe teachers need to learn a bit more about how to include international students in their teaching. Uh, there's also a need for these arenas where students can meet outside the university and as Ole Petter talked about, uh, some institutions like the University of Oslo, they do a lot of things to, to include uh, international students, but housing is one important aspect and also other activities that are attractive to, to national as well as international students. And I think that some of these tasks are more challenging than others. But I think there's a need to focus on this because, as we know, there's a pressure on tuition fees and some political parties are skeptical. And I think that uh, this pressure will increase even more if the higher education institutions do not manage to convince politicians and people that the international students are actually quite beneficial for the activities. Thank you. Thank you, Janneke. And now for the professor and the wolves and the Swedes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I will have to make a confession. A confession of a crime. <laughs> because, in fact, right now, I was supposed to be teaching my students. Uh, and the reason why I'm here is that I, I, the reason why I was supposed to do that is that I had put in the wrong date for this debate. So I got luckily an SMS from the organizers and I was able to go here and I failed my students. And I, mostly it shows something about the poor organize, organizational qualities of professors, but it also shows some of the dilemmas of, uh, of the academic life and all the all activities you're supposed to take part in. Um, I, I guess I am here uh, not only because I have some experience with international students, I teach a lot of them, um, but also because um, I think I'm supposed to take a role as a, a little bit more less uh, enthusiastic about uh, the, uh, the wonders of uh, international students. And I will try to take that role. However, I want to stress that, of course, as an academic, I don't believe in borders. Uh, I, I was even leader of the International Association of Agricultural Students when I was a student at Aarhus um, a long time ago. And I remember it was a great pleasure to sit at the campfire discussing uh, colonial politics with uh, students from Tanzania and, I have to admit, getting dead drunk with uh, uh, students from behind the uh, Iron Curtain. Anyway, I certainly believe in internationalization, the importance, but I think uh, the solution to the challenge that we have talked about today about a lack of contact uh, between the international Norwegian students cannot be solved from outside. It must be solved by inspiring, by changing the students and accepting that some students are not academically mature enough to actually be able to take part in an exchange on an international level. 
This is just how it is, because we have to admit, and I like what you, my, my previous uh, speaker said, we have to admit that the quality of the international students, as well as the quality of the Norwegian students, they vary, and they have varying ability to contribute uh, in a contact between students. Remember, now I'm talking solely about the academic side of this, not the social side of it, which is, of course is also important, but as from a university uh, perspective, I guess we are most concerned with how this contributes to higher academic quality. Uh, so uh, what we have to do, and God knows how to do that, but what we have to do, we have to inspire the students uh, to uh, see the benefits of uh, having interaction with foreign students. If the foreign students actually are able to contribute to a higher academic standard. And, and if I was going to be very rude and general, I would say generally students from Europe are actually, in my experience, uh, generally more inspiring than the average Norwegian student. So I think the Norwegian students could have a lot to gain academically from being inspired by the hardworking French students, for example. Um, but uh, for uh, uh, students from other countries where they have a very different academic culture, maybe it's not so easy to expect a large uh, academic benefit in interacting because some of those students, particularly on a bachelor level, and I think we should question whether we really would like most of the students that are international to be bachelor students. Perhaps we should focus more on master student level where they have a more higher academic maturity. Anyway, uh, many of those are will need to be trained in the fundamentals of academic thinking and really um, I think that's the uh, job of the uh, university professors, uh, not the least. So um, I think that please, I would say, please don't have more social gatherings and use a lot of university money on trying to force students together. This is not the way, I think. I think the way is to uh, be able to argue for that there actually is an academic benefit in interacting with students. And of course this plays back to the academic quality of the Norwegian education system. Uh, uh, we, in, we should, I mean, a good academic would of course uh, be, be driven by curiosity and willingness to learn, will always see opportunities, but the student must have that interest in order for this to work. So I don't believe in external uh, forces but I believe in trying in some way to inspire the students and to look into how we can increase the quality of the students, both in Norway and internationally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, for a very thought-provoking uh, speech. And final panelists, you have already spoken today, but we'll give you another five minutes to repeat all your main points. No, <laughs> these points will be new. And uh, I think Janneke has a very, very important message uh, coupled to the term perspectives. I think the best way to proceed would be for all institutions to put a sign in each auditorium with one word, perspectives. Because I think what is missing is an understanding, and of course, I'm also willing to criticize ourselves, the diversity leaders, the teachers, we have to make it much clearer to everybody this very close coupling between perspectives and quality in education. And uh, it's often helpful to look at the extremes. A couple of years ago, I was taking part in a lesson in our summer school. And uh, the topic was some of these global challenges, in inequities, inequalities, poverty, resource distribution, climate, clean water, and so forth. This is an extreme situation in the sense that it's impossible to discuss these matters without having the perspectives of international students. I mean, in, in order to understand a challenge, you really have to get acquainted with it. 
as we see, say in Norwegian, du må se utfordringen i Hvitøya. And there is no way you can do that without having the perspectives from those, part of the, those parts of the world where these challenges are most abundant. So I think that if you look at these extremes, we easily understand how, it is, how important it is for adequate and high quality education to have the perspectives of the international students. And of course, I'm talking about an extreme situation where we discuss global challenges. By nature, they are global and they must be discussed on the basis of perspectives from all over the place. But to the same extent, I think quality is fostered and in fact kindled by having this international perspective very much in evidence. And this can easily be done if, for instance, there was designed perspectives here in this auditorium. Because it will remind each of us how important it is for quality to have a richness of perspectives. And this goes back to us as teachers, as I say, and back to us as, um, as uh, university leaders. By the way, these challenges that I'm talking about, the global challenges, they are not really taken into account in our own education system. Now, the UN system has come up with the uh, SDG again, agenda, Sustainable Development Goals. This requires also that we take these into account in our own education system. And we haven't done this thus far in our own country. And, but when we do this, when we start to discuss the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, in our own education programs, we will see that we not only would like to have international particip participation, we have to have international participation. There's one last issue I would like to, to address. And that is something that has been completely missing so far in the debate. You're talking about inclusive. How should we have an inclusive education system? And one thing, of course, is to take care and to include those international students that are already here. But the question is, whom should we include? And what we are seeing now in many countries, including our own, is that we miss out when it comes to inclusiveness. Because we tend to forget about the perspectives and the students from the poorest countries in the world. And thus we miss many very important perspectives. For instance, when it comes to poverty and resource distribution. One example, and now I'm looking at the CEO representatives here, the quota program was ideally suited to recruit students from the countries in the world that are worst off when it comes to economy, for instance, Western Africa. Now this has been replaced by NORPART. And it's interesting to see, when you look at the statutes of NORPART, it has a sort of double duty. It should not only serve to invite students from poor countries, but it should also add to our own quality. So it has a double duty function. And the risk, we don't know whether this will play out as yet, but the risk is that we miss many perspectives because we would like to support the quality in the sense that we would like to basically, primarily, engage with other so-called high-quality institutions. This is a danger. So when we, when we use the term inclusive, we must also think, who do we include? And we must not forget to include those students that come from those countries with the greatest global challenges. Thank you, Ole Petter. Very eloquent as always. And uh, I think it perspectives, it would have been a nice name for a new blog, wouldn't it? Like very <laughs> um, We're going to open up for uh, some questions and debate, but um, I was thinking first maybe we should give the chance for you to respond to each other's uh, talks. And, and one theme uh, that several of you have touched upon is, because you seem to all be more or less ag uh, agreeing on uh, the problem here, that there is not enough interaction between international students and Norwegian students. Um, but where is the responsibility um, for uh, increasing this interaction? Because you all rep you should represent kind of five or four different um, characters within this, the inclusion system. I mean, the leadership, the, the academic staff, and the, the overall student or representative, and, and international students. So, who should make this happen? Do you think who, who has the main? Where, where is the problem, and who, who should sort of make the first move? Anyone? Janneke? Well, as I, as I mentioned, I think 
we have to start with with the institutions because they have need to organize uh, the courses in the way that international students and Norwegian students are in the same courses. It should almost not be allowed to have courses just for international students. So that will be a start, and then some other things could move on from there. Yes, Christina. Yes, I completely agree that the main responsibility should lie with, with the institutions. And as I also said, it should be on faculty level, it should be on a more central level. Uh, it should be like a streamline throughout the whole education system. Uh, but also I think that Norwegian and international students also, of course, have some responsibility. Uh, in inclusion won't just happen by itself, but you need some good, some good framework for it to actually happen. But I also, if I could just ask, uh, sure. ask a question. Yeah, I would like to ask you a question, of course, because you were the most critical. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask, because you were talking about the maturity of students. And my question is that, shouldn't we help them to be more mature? Shouldn't academia help them to be more mature so they can partake in the internationalization? Or should we just say, sorry, you're not mature enough we don't want you in our internationalization process. And also, uh, the thing you talked about, about um, seeing the benefit academically. We also see that this counts also as for international, domestic, I think every student, is that when they have a good social life, they also perform a lot better academically. So it's not, we can't just forget about the social part and, uh, and just see the academical benefit of international students. Yeah. Yes, my job as a lecturer at the university is actually to try to inspire the students or teach them uh, and make them academically mature. So that's my job, that's my responsibility. And I think uh, uh, I am we are obviously not doing a good enough job when the students are not academically mature enough uh, to understand the benefits of being active with international students. So, uh, so, so that's, that's his responsibility we have to make. But that is a responsibility that goes down to each individual uh, lecturer. And uh, not by making more skiing courses uh, or something like that. Uh, so uh, we have, so it's, but it's really the core of our activity. So yes, that's our responsibility. And then, in my opinion, uh, so this is of course something I'm trying, but, but the contact between the students, that is the student's responsibility, in my opinion. So, uh, if, so this is my point. It's not the administration's uh, uh, responsibility. Of course, when I hear you saying that you're actually organizing different courses for international and Norwegian students, I'm quite surprised we don't do that at all. We, and, and remember, folks, that has a cost. So when I teach bachelor level courses in English, the Norwegian students, of course, are not so happy about that. Um, so uh, this is also some, one of the reasons why I'm a little bit uh, surprised that actually the majority of exchange students are actually bachelor students. I think that it, it would be more logical that we actually invite and invite students to go abroad at a more mature level. So that would be a solution to the lack of maturity in the students. So this would be my answer. Thank you. You have a comment, uh, Pedro? Uh, I want to go back to the responsibility question. Yeah? yeah, sure. I don't believe that we need to make someone responsible of this. We all need to put our hands under the rock. OK, some has more powers, rectors, or students. Students, if they cannot put the hand under the rock, only a finger, but you, 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 all of us need to do something. If we put or give this responsibility to someone, to administration, or to scholars, or to students, it's not gonna work. The rock is really heavy, because we are really talking about a large amount of students. We are talking about academicians. We are talking about administrative class. Everyone, why don't we put all our hands under the rock instead of giving the responsibility and making that place work more than others. I believe we all need to do something instead of putting the responsibility to someone else. Yeah. Ulfet, do you want to say something? Uh, yes. Uh, I would come up with another uh, perspective here. 
Um, I, I think in many ways it's all about nurturing curiosity. It's very strange that we as teachers and academics, we talk about curiosity-driven research all the time. Curiosity-driven research, that's, that's the goal. But how about curiosity-driven education? And now I'm talking about curiosity on the part of the teachers as well as the students because, well, I could be self-critical. When I taught at the most, of course, I was very much inclined to be in my own comfort zone. I thought I had the right perspectives. But I should have asked myself, and all of us who are teachers should ask ourselves, shouldn't we move out of, the, of our comfort zone and say that we need to kindle, exploit, utilize our curiosity to have as many perspectives as possible and to question our own perspectives. If also the students do this, well, internationalization is the answer. So I think we are in a very strange situation where we have one set of values for our research and an entirely different set of values for our education. And never shall the twain meet. Well, I hope they will meet because that's a very good way to proceed. Thank you. Yeah. Don't forget that curiosity killed the cat, though. So uh, I want to there get back. Cats. I want to get back to another thing that because language is an issue here. And if uh, I mean, there's a reason that Norwegian and international students don't meet uh, all the time in the classroom. It's because most uh, international students are taught in English. So how how does language play in? I mean, we're all sitting here. Uh, none of us has English as their first language. Well, how does it affect the? teaching and academic uh, um, culture that everything has, has to happen in English? Or should we just suppose that international students learn Norwegian? Yes? I believe, and I've experienced this, 99.99% .99 of the Norwegians which I've met knew English. Some didn't know better than me, which I'm not good at English, I don't say that. But I believe uh, English is not, <coughs> it's not a point in this. Norway, uh, the international students should try learning Norwegians, which I'm really trying to learn. But it's a master's degree, everything is in English. I only can learn from my friends, mm -hmm. which I hear, or th that's only a short amount. When it comes to bachelor degree, okay, it, it changes because everything is taught in Norwegian, they need to learn. But I don't believe English is a point in this, and as maybe most of you are Norwegians, and I don't believe that there isn't anyone who doesn't understand me. Everyone does. Yeah. So I think we'll open up for questions from uh, from the room. Does anyone have uh, questions to any of the to all or any of the panelists? <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, I didn't see you down there. <laughs> Please. Yeah, sorry, my battery on my smartphone went out, so otherwise I would say it <laughs> this way. No, but I think what I hear a bit with, with your story, Birger, is that it, the, 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 there's a key question, namely, is there in a kind of like an academic motivation for this internationalization? So if I go out to study somewhere, why would this internationalization thing be part of the deal, uh, of my academic formation? And I think that answer needs to be given. Um, and then if the answer is yes, and I think there are some good arguments to be made for that, uh, then we need to provide a structure for students to mingle. Because if we don't provide a structure, gravity will hit them, and they will simply go with the people who are like them and with whom it's easy to, to, to chat and to have a relaxing talk. The question then is whether we also need to need Norwegian in order to relax with Norwegian students. I mean, or Dutch to, to relax with the Dutch. So the mother tongue has a certain effect that the second language um, does not have. So one question is also whether it's, the, the, the question of whether English is the only language. Thank you. Anyone wants to comment? Uh, I, I'm not sure if I quite understood, but uh, but uh, I think that um, uh, obviously, I mean, we need to make sure that uh, international students and the Norwegian students meet. But I am thinking that, well, from my experience, then that, that we don't teach English and Norwegian students separately. But 
they're all in the same course, they all have the same challenges, they're all sitting in the same room, and I guess there is a, a student society, and they usually live at the, at the student housing together with Norwegian students, at least they do at us. So we should provide the basic means of uh, making it possible to for students to contact each other. But I think that we should not have too much expectations of the value of doing very much more, because that would be kind of a forced uh, interactions, uh, which I, it doesn't solve the fundamental problem. But, uh, but you asked about something else, uh, about the Norwegian language. Uh, I, I didn't understand, but... but, but two different things. One, one thing Sorry, I have to need a, a microphone. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> No, the, the the key thing is that if you if you look different, if you have different languages, and you don't do something, gravity will hit you, and people will sit with the people who are like them. Mm -hmm. And so, if you want to prevent that, you need to think about something. And whether you know you go out doing cross country, that would be tempting for me. But uh, um, shared teamwork, solving problems together, that would be logically connected to the study, and not just going out. But what I, what I also see with, with, with English versus the native language is that if you only speak English with one another, there are certain limitations to how much, how easy it is to just go out and relax and connect. Mm -hmm. that, that, is, that needs to be part of the discussion, that, that speaking a second language for all of us with different levels of fluently mm -hmm. just stops you from relaxing Mm. And, and connecting in certain ways. And so when you were in Paris, probably you, you spoke French, and that's why you connected. Uh, so it's, but that's a different story. So, but um, gravity is the thing that we need to <laughs> fight against. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is a very important point, of course. There is, a, what I said also in my introduction, there's a cost. We have to be aware of the cost. There is a cost, particularly when we have uh, international students on a bachelor uh, level, really everything must be in English, ideally. <coughs> everything must be. We f must forget the Norwegian language in our teaching situation. And of course, uh, in that extreme case, we are losing something in fluency, we are losing something in easiness of communicating. And I also see it with my students, uh, most of the classes I teach, both, both bachelor and, and, and master level, is in, taught in English. And I see that the students are more hesitant in asking questions, for example, which is a tragedy when they don't. Uh, so, so really, uh, we have to be aware of this cost. And of course, it is a cost that we uh, need to communicate in another mother tongue. So I, I agree about that. What about that? <laughs> but I, I think we should be prepared to pay quite a lot for what uh, internationalization gives us. Let's go back to Erasmus Plus. I was shocked to learn that the Erasmus Plus student exchange program has produced a, at least one million children. <laughs> I'm not shocked, I'm relieved. And I think this is something we should not forget, that when we talk about the costs, what are the costs of not interacting across borders? We need a world with much more trust and I think that internationalization is one of the most important ingredients for building trust. And you cannot really estimate the cost of trust. <laughs> yeah, I'm going a little bit back to the language part. Uh, so uh, if we have a lot of international students, that most of them that come to Norway ha doesn't have English as their first language. And we don't have English as our first language, so we are on equal terms. So I think that if we demand more of the international student that they should learn more Norwegian, that it will be more unequal, because then we would have the fluency of our own language, but then it will be harder for the international students to have the fluency in another language. It might be their third or fourth language again. So I think that we should be, like the law is today, that is really persistent on strengthening the Norwegian language in higher education. And I think that could be a really big obstacle in actually including international students in our, uh, in our uh, higher education system, and especially at bachelor level. So I, I see some problems of, uh, of course, there should be free and opportunities for international students to be able to learn the language. But I also think that 
it should be an addition and not that we require it. We have a question on, on uh, Twitter, uh, also on the language uh, issue. Johanna Voglan, uh, where are you sitting? There you are. Um, I think Norwegian students hesitate to take the word in, in, uh, during the classes. Uh, and it doesn't help if they additionally have to talk English. So how, what can we do to solve this? Use Twitter. <laughs> Use Twitter. <laughs> yes. More Twitter. More Twitter. Christine, I have a well, suggestion. Yeah, the, it's, it's a really good question and it's a really good answer as well. Uh, I know that a lot of international students have the possibility, and not only for, uh, for their not their mother tongue, but also if they're in a big like auditorium like this, it can be it can be awkward to raise your hand and to speak out loudly in public. So actually, to have the possibility to interact with the students without them actually have to raise their hand and lower the barrier and the the, the ground of them to actually interact, I think that is really really uh, important. But also, I I feel like myself like a language. English is not my first language, and I'm really uh, subconscious about my, uh, my uh, English as well. But I think that's also a personal matter that we need to overcome, that if we are afraid of the positives that we can gain by actually trying, that we lose a lot more than if we actually put ourselves out there and try. Good. Do you want to uh, uh, really comment on the same? Coming from the countryside, I'm, I'm obviously more old-fashioned than uh, Ole Petter Otzen because I, <laughs> I usually offer my students to answer in Norwegian and, I, and then I, and I will translate uh, the question and answer in English. So, so yeah. of course, that's a, a possibility, but it is, uh, there is, uh, it is important to be aware of this uh, uh, this cost. I, I also agree. I mean, I in, personally, I think we should forget about Norwegian. Just uh, say universities know we are taught in English. I, I would probably be a little. And now I'm from the sciences side of it. Things are easier. It would probably be a little bit more difficult in the Norwegian uh, <laughs> academic uh, life. But anyway, uh, that is something we have to uh, we have to be aware of. We can't get both. I mean, uh, if we want to have an international campus, we have to forget about Norwegian. We can't expect students to learn Norwegian when they come here for two years. I think that's that's stupid because Norwegian, honestly, what can you use it for? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we have one question uh, up here, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anne Björsvik and I come from the University Center in Svalbard and we've have forgotten everything about Norwegian. Um, we welcome uh, last year 759 students from 44 countries, and uh, all our instruction is done in English. And that was um, my comment as well. I think that um, having a student community from all over the world where a minority has English as their mother tongue, the important stuff is actually the academics. It is um, the different topics that the students come to uh, study uh, that brings them together. If they don't feel comfortable speaking English, after a week they will be. Uh, they will still make mistakes, but that is not what's bringing them together. It's the experience of being on Svalbard, it's experience of uh, uh, learning um, new stuff uh, within the natural sciences. And we can see also that we have a student group as an entity. It doesn't matter if you're a Norwegian or an international student. You all come together. So I think, forget about the Norwegian. <laughs> Just let's stick to English. It works for us. Thank you. <laughs> so we all agree that we should just ditch Norwegian and start talking Norwegian. <laughs> Uh, there is a, I mean, related to the language problem is the question of, uh, of uh, exchange, like typically one semester exchange and degree studies. Do you have any opinions on that? Because that goes both ways for the, or now we're talking about the, the international students in Norway. I mean, you can't expect the same language skills and obviously this, this game, the same level of integration from uh, exchange students who are here for maybe four or five months than you can for those who actually take a full degree. <laughs> I can make something like a similar or short comment. Imagine Norwegian students going about for Erasmus. They need to speak English. Otherwise, yeah. no chance to find someone more than a couple of students maybe knows Norwegian. Maybe. I don't believe that, but maybe. 
we cannot take out Norwegian from bachelor degree, my opinions are this, but if we try to put English more into our bachelor degrees and encourage more Norwegian students to go abroad, because it, it will really bring a lot of knowledge back to Norway. Because you go for Erasmus to exchange, six months, one year, you don't sleep there, you work. You, uh, you start using your English that you knew, but it was somewhere here back of your brain, but you don't have any chance to use it here. If the professor starts teaching in English, making Norwegians speak more in English, it will be like, they will be one point ahead from the others when they go abroad. But as I said, this might not sound good for everyone, but I believe that exchange should be, like, not com like they need to do exchange program, minimum three months. If they don't want to do exchange, they should apply to not do exchange. Every program, we should include this Erasmus exchange program in every studies we have in bachelor. And then not force, because when we force, it doesn't work in our students. But encourage them to go abroad and take the knowledge there and bring it back to Norway. Christina, you want to comment? Yeah, we have, uh, we are revising our policy paper on internationalization actually at our General Assembly, NSO, uh, and we have that a suggestion that we want to make uh, make exchange opt out as an option out that it you should apply to not go to exchange instead. But I wanted to comment a little bit about um, how we can make the interaction happen more with the, especially with students that are here for a shorter period of time is that we can also look at possibilities to not have uh, full courses on English but we can have shorter projects more workshops that doesn't have to be for a half a year or th three months if you for instance have uh, in Antanu they have something called experts in team which is an interdisciplinary um, project thing that it's more about the creativity and the innovation, and it's really more directed to future learning. That can help students work on handling challenges uh, of tomorrow uh, by meeting students that studied different things than you. And that will also make it easier for international and Norwegian students to meet. And you can have these kinds of projects that last for a day, that last for a week. It doesn't have to be complete courses to actually have uh, the integration happen. Hmm. Good point. So I th we have to start uh, running up soon, but we have time for uh, at least one more question. If anyone has a question um, to the panelists. Yes, over there, up there. My name is Becky Neudwang, and I work at the American College of Norway, which is a very small program. And at the American College, we have made it a part of our culture to really um, create and cultivate that inter international competency, which we talked about earlier. Every single class that is taught at the American College of Norway is focused on perspective. How do we bring in different perspectives from our American students, our Norwegian students, our other international students? It's a cultural aspect of our institution. And I was wondering, when we have 50 to 70 students, we can do that, right? We can, we can make that happen. But how can you do that in Norway at the larger institutions with thousands and thousands of students? How can you really make this international competency, which is a goal that we all share, how can we make that part of our institutional culture? Yes, Birger. That is, that's a good point. Look to America. Uh, I'm not necessarily talking about the presidential uh, choices so far, but I'm thinking about the American academic culture. I was uh, lucky as part, as part of my PhD work, I was uh, was in the U.S. and they have a wonderful academic culture. They have a, a open, uh, a, a friendly. Uh, so that's a good point. Look to America and see what they're doing there because they're really able. They're, I think, at least my experience is that they really have a unique culture there where they welcome foreigners and they are open to this and they are they are creating a, a very good uh, 
academic uh, environment at the universities. So, so this is yeah, this is culture, folks. This is this is this is uh, this is. Uh, but what is it? Tandelse uh, in English. I don't know what the word is. Even this is this is. Uh, Bildung. Could, huh? It's just in German. Bildung. <laughs> Bildung. This is building. Bildung. Uh, but anyway, this is this is the character building of people is really uh, a very important part of the challenge. And where we as 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 teachers have a responsibility. Maybe that's the most important. Uh, responsibility we have more than teaching them what uh, vitamin C is for. I mean, uh, even more important is to teach them uh, the academic way of life. Great. Um, we'll Peter, you had a word, and then we, uh, this yeah. will be the last round, so we'll take uh, a, uh, I mean, we, we, one minute. For we, each we, I then. can take my last minute now. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I think we are on the wrong track if we look at languages just as barriers. Just Three, four years ago, I was in, uh, at Humboldt University, and uh, I attended a class, German students discussing Pergunt in Norwegian, without a trace of an accent, I dare say. I mean, language is of importance in itself. It carries our culture, so we should not look at languages just as barriers. That's my point. When it comes to culture, I think it's amazing that for the third or fourth years, year in a row, this theme attracts so many people here. Because, I mean, when you go back to your institutions, there is no way that uh, these institutions will not be carried away with the culture that you will be, be bringing back from this meeting. I think it's a very positive thing that the interest in inter internationalization is to the scale that we are seeing here today. Thank you. Thank you. Then it's uh, Birger. Final word, if you want to say Final words, final wow. Word. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> you can keep talking for um, an hour. Well, this whole thing has been a stand-up thing, you know, since <laughs> I wasn't able to prepare, but uh, since I thought it was tomorrow. But anyway, um, I think that um, the, the, the point is, my point is that I think that uh, we have to teach the students. I mean, we have to change the, we have to inspire the students to understand the importance of interactions. And then I think, honestly, we have to maybe not uh, have the goal of sending everybody out because I think it requires some academic uh, uh, qualifications that not all students have. And so we should also require something from the students uh, when it comes to, for example, the expectations of uh, being allowed to go abroad at any time during the study. So I am a little bit there to, I, to, to, to demand more from the students. I know it, that's not uh, fashionable at these times, but this is also part of the problem. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, well. First of all, I just want to say that I don't think that we can sort of leave Norwegian as an academic language. It should be possible to combine. But I would just go back to a point that uh, Ole Petter made about um, um, what we should think about when we want to internationalize and have mobility. Because, I mean, in the, the rhetorics, it tends to be more that we, we focus on quality, but there are so many other rationales than just academic quality uh, that can be used as arguments for, for uh, student mobility. And uh, global responsibility, international, um, and um, sort of solidarity could be reasons, also cultural, social aspects. We have to think of these things as well. And also, actually, if we look at sort of the benefits, there are also quite a lot of economic benefits, maybe not for the institution, but for the Norwegian society, because quite a lot of these students actually s stay behind in Norway. So we get, it's a kind of skilled migration. We get a lot of people staying here with a lot of skills from abroad. That hasn't costed the Norwegian Norwegian government a lot of money. So, I mean, even if you think very cynical at this, it's, it's actually uh, some uh, positive effect that we rarely talk about. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Resource and opportunities, I guess, for an international campus, we know you Norwegians and we Norwegians have that resources and opportunities, but uh, it's not, not my business to say this, but if you want to have a to-do list, 
for every day day, I share this with me, always like smile. Just smile to an international <laughs> student. Just ask how they are. If you are sitting with five Norwegians, invite them to your table. With this small stuff, you'll see that it's gonna be bigger, bigger like a snowball. It's gonna be huge and internationalization will be sold, I guess. Only smile and ask, how are you? It didn't take my like three seconds. It won't take more than five seconds to ask this and receive. Just smile and ask. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> We have so much to learn from you guys. <laughs> Christina, a final word. It's not fair to be at uh, behind him when he's so charming. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it so much harder. Uh, okay, I want to uh, to uh, to end this with uh, some some thoughts that I didn't have uh, got to bring up, and I think that uh, a lot of uh, the important stuff happens also outside of the classrooms, that the associations need to be so much more open and inclusive to international students. And I don't think that associ associations want to be exclusive. I don't just think they don't know how to be inclusive and that they don't think about how do we put our information out on both languages, because it's really easy to forget. So I think, for example, the welfare associations, like some ship also has a responsibility to provide courses for associations. How can you be more open and inclusive to all members of higher education, not only as international students, but everyone? Um, and also, I think that it's really important to put the student in center. Ask, collect data, try to have pilot projects, what works, what doesn't work, how can we make it more inclusive to international students by listening to what they actually need, and also to Norwegian students. So I think that is uh, my last tips for today, and yeah. Thank you. And for this conference, we have put the international student in the center. So <laughs> thank you to all the five panelists. You also have your gifts, except for Mule Petter, who has already got his. <laughs> and uh, I happen to know what's in this, and it's actually uh, salad servers. Oh. So I, uh, I encourage you to use the salad servers to uh, integrate the various parts of the salad with each other, so you can <laughs> increase the eating process experience quality of it. Thank you. And now another guy with uh, a shaved head is going to take the scene, please. All right, um, I've been sitting here with you guys since lunch and listening to all this perspective stuff. And you know, sometimes, you know, when something really strikes a chord, one of the speakers says something that resonates deep, deep within you. It just happened for me in this debate. Do you guys remember what Dr. Ursula Brinkman said? What we all have to fight is gravity. <laughs> and all the guys that have passed 40 in this room know what I'm talking about. You know, it's what the Americans call the furniture disease when your chest falls into your drawers. <laughs> Thank you for reminding us. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, guys, um, <clears throat> you guys are all from, uh, you know, academics, so you guys are, you play Kahoot every day. Uh, they go like, um, uh, what? And uh, what we need you to do now, if you could just light up the screen, is get this social device of yours. And oh, no, not, oh, thank you. <laughs> the, the most horrible background side. Uh, get this thing and open up your web browser, because we're going to play. That's the fun part of my job, is whenever I'm on stage, people are like, oh, yeah, now it's the fun time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what you do is you go to kahoot.it. Somebody always gets this wrong. Please stand up. And then it, it'll tell you to enter the game pin. And once you've done that, it'll tell you, you know, choose a nick. That could be the name you wanted to have, or the one you have, or anything else. There we go. Wow, you have played before. OK, this is an extremely scientific poll. So you're relative to concentrate. Some of these questions are really, 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 really deep, and some are not. So you can just you know, answer whatever. But it'll be fun.
Guys, you guys are quick. <laughs> Yoo-hoo! Nickname. Whose nickname? <laughs> yeah. That's good. <laughs> Choose a nickname. Nickname. <laughs> At least he follows orders, you know. His wife's very happy with him. That's good. Are you, are you work with IT or? No? Yeah, it is Nick. <laughs> so it's not a nickname, it's a nickname. <laughs> I like it. It's great, you know, I love when people think inside the box, you know, it <laughs> makes sense. Okay, you guys get, are you ready? Are we more than 185 people? Oh, who left? Someone just left. They're like, no, this is too stupid, I'm not gonna, no. Yeah. Okay, 188, 108. Okay, we're gonna begin <coughs> really soon. If not, you know, I'm gonna break my time limit and then they'll fire me. We don't want that. You guys ready? Yeah, one person's ready, so we'll start. <laughs> this is very good. All right, go ahead. Now, you guys, you know, the questions come up on here, and then the different answers are also up here, and they're color-coded. Now, you, you, you're not supposed to, like, blue. That happens on your phone, okay? <laughs> so I don't want all of you come up here and like, oh, I want blue. <laughs> you get the colors here, and you're supposed to punch here, okay? Somebody always comes running up. And says, ah! I didn't get to answer. You guys ready? The winner? I uh, can't say. It's a secret. I know. Because if you get the same thing, you're not going to play? Is that it? Oh, you'll give it someone else. OK. OK, good. All right, <coughs> go ahead. Let's get started. I like the laughs. <laughs> yeah, the first answer is yes, no, it's mostly about cutting costs. Don't understand what he's talking about, it's green, and perhaps in principle, but not in practice. <coughs> All right. That's good. Next question. Is internationalization a premise for increased quality in higher education? Can you guys see it now? Yes. You guys all agree. It's good. Okay, next one. Well, the answer is obviously no. <laughs> is anybody like always pressing blue? I, I just like blue. I'll go with blue. <laughs> ah! This is like uh, <laughs> Sturting, yeah? <laughs> you know, it's like in a fun year, you know? <laughs> and then you have the small parties, it's like, nah, we want stuff. Okay, big parties. Okay, go ahead. What do you think is the most important intercultural competency? <laughs> Gravity. <laughs> Communication. Good. All right, next. Now, this is one of the questions we got during the lunch break. Um, so who do we send? The teachers or the students? <laughs> All the teachers are like, oh, we want to go. <laughs> ah, yeah, of course, the teachers answered because, yeah. 
Makes sense. It's the exact opposite if you ask the students, you know, send the teachers. Go ahead. Do higher education institutions do enough to combat polarization within society? We'll try to sway the right answer here <laughs> in case you didn't notice. Blue. <laughs> That's the person, that, you know, the blue. <laughs> Just because I said it. Ah, blue is probably more right than the green, yellow. Next. <laughs> How well do you know Kurt? You're actually all right, because they're all his reasons for going abroad. <laughs> Next. <coughs> Who should take the main responsibility for the integration of international students? This is what answers the debate we just had. International students themselves, Norwegian students, the institutions, or the student organizations? Fatula, you can press blue. <laughs> yes. But we will do whatever you guys answer for next year's conference. I just, <laughs> I forgot to say that at the start. The institutions. Next. How can Norwegian campuses become more international and inclusive? I guess the debate answered that too. Speak English. Include international students in compulsory courses. House international students with Norwegians. Create more social arenas where students meet. And more courses for Norwegian students taught in English. We do need that, though. <laughs> blue lost. <laughs> well, what's happening? I thought blue was always. Go ahead. <clears throat> what does it take to engage you? And this is going to set the premise for next year's <laughs> IK 2018. <laughs> This is a really important question, though. <laughs> That's what we thought. <laughs> I, I, like the, I like the split between the people that are like, we're ready to go party, and then this is a serious conference. You know, this, those are the two groups. We have to integrate you. That's important. OK, um, one of the things when I do a poll on Kahoot is, like Fatula said, is there going to be a winner? No. You're all winners. But because there's extra gifts here, I just found that out. Um, and because you all like salad, because that's what it's for, uh, we have a bonus question. Uh, and because I'm an international mutt myself, the person that first guesses how many years I've lived abroad wins this? Seven. Zero. Se seven? No? Huh? Eleven. No? Fourteen. Closer? Twenty. Thirty. Eighteen. Eight. Who said eighteen? Okay, you win. <laughs> eighteen years. And I'm just nineteen. <laughs> um, that's the Kahoot. I'm also going to be leading the dinner tonight, so I hope you're not tired of me yet. But we'll have a lot of fun. But to tell you more about that and more details, you know, please welcome our beloved Vidar from CU. Give him a big hand. Vidar, where are you? And I'll see you tonight. Sånn, hører du meg nå? Ja, har lært litt av Katrine Sannes i løpet av dagen. 
Tack för applåsen. Eh, Först får jag tacka alla sammen eh, här ja, inledare och paneldeltagare, twitterare och alla andra i salen som har bidragit till att det är en efter mitt syn flott dag. Vi är på tampen så jag ska inte upphålla er så allt för länge. Eh, men jag syns i alla fall att eh, vi ska reflektera lite över eh, det vi har eh, hört idag och fortsätta med det eh, också eh, i löp av kvällen i hygglig socialt lag. Och det bästa av allt är att vi är bara halvfärdig med internationella sändskonferensen 2017. Det kommer också en dag i morgon. Det har varit en varierad dag, varierat innehåll. Eh, jag tror att vi har fått visat att internationalisering är ett vitt begrepp. Det drar sig inte bara om studentmobilitet, eh, men det drar sig självklart eh, mye om det också. Vi vet att eh, det att individer flyttar på sig, att det är bevegelse, är nödvändig. Det är en kärnaktivitet i en form för internationellt samarbete. Och idag mer än någonsin. Vi tränger att känna på det, vad det vill säga si att leva i och mästra andra kulturer. Titeln på den konferensen Gränslös utdannelse eh, spelar sig följligt på det. Och ospelar på utdannelse som är det vi alla håller på med men också på dannelse och behovet för att resa ut. Dannelse eh, är ju ett ord som har kommit lite på moten igen de senaste åren. Eh, kanske inte så lätt att definiera, men det vill säga si det er kanske något det som vi tränger mest idag. Eh, något det vi tränger för att påverka det som vi utan tvivel kan se si på många måter är en negativ och skummel utveckling i stora delar av världen. Vi har fått både politiska perspektiv idag, institutionella perspektiv, individperspektiv. Eh, och dessa hänger helt tydligt samman. Som Fabian Sulek sa, we must fight those who want to close minds and borders. Eh, och dessa ting hänger samman. Utan tvivel. Vi ser stänger gränser så stänger vi också för exponering för nya tankar, för nya impulser för kreativ nyfikenhet. Och det är en illusion att tro att vi kan upprätthålla en open mind, vi säker vi också har öppna gränser. Vi skapar ett annat land vi är i mötekommande för internationella studenter sa Ole Petter Ottersen. Och det tror han har helt rätt i. Vi skapar också ett land vi är öppen själv för att resa ut och hämta in impulser. Och det i det samfunnet vi lever i idag och det samfunnet vi kommer att leva med framöver så är det ett viktigare än någonsin. Ska den typ av öppenhet och inkludering lyckas där emot eller ska den lyckas så kan vi inte bara tänka på högre utbildning. Detta vill börja mycket tidigare, det vill börja i skolan. Och ska vi lyckas med det i skolan så måste vi också lyckas med det i lärarutbildningen. Och jag hoppas alla fick med sig, det var ju den stora applåsen. Jag hoppas alla fick med sig att Björn Högstad hade 10 miljoner kronor med till dere alla samman idag. Eh, det är ju vardags statssekreterare det. Sonja, kom igen. Och vi i CU kan i alla fall se si det att vi ser fram till att kunna bygga ut ett gott partnerskapsprogram för grundskollärarutbildningarna för att öka internationella sängar lärarutbildningar ett ställe där det er både behov och og också stort potential. Och så tänker jag lite tillbaka. Eh, man har ju läst olika stortingsmeddelanden upp genom åren. I 1997 så kom det en stortingsmelding, jag tror det är stortingsmeddelanden 19 om utbildning i utlandet. Där blev det satt ett mål om hur stor andel av norska studenter som skulle dra på utväxling. I 1997. Någon som vet vad det målet var? Ja, någon vet det, det vet det. 50 procent. Det är sagt i 1997. Och det är mer än 12 år sedan för att brukar högstas parallell. Så vi hoppas att det inte tränger att ta 20 år till för vi faktiskt når dit. Eh, men det är i alla fall intressant att se att målen har varit stora utan att vi alltid har nått dig för heller. Så jeg tror det ligger bättre till rätt nu. Vi kan vara mer optimistiska. Det finns fler incitiv. Det finns en grundläggande större uppmärksamhet omkring viktigheten av internationalisering. Eh, och vi ser också att internationalisering kommer in som ett viktigt begrepp i eh, för kvalitet och ökad kvalitet i norsk högre utbildning. Så jag tror inte det ska ta varken 12 eller 20 år för vi börjar närma oss detta, men det är en jobb att göra som vi har gör samman med er. 
Men vi kan jo tenke litt da, på utvikling. Erasmus-programmet fyller 30 år i år. Erasmus-programmet var ikke noen selvfølgelig da du kom i 1987. Hvis du leser litt eh, historien til programmet, så var det litt med nød og neppe. Stor motstand mot å tenke på den måten at studenter skulle reise ut og ta eksamen et annet sted, til og med et annet land. Eh, og det var ikke i akademia som var den, hvor det var den minste motstanden, for å si det sånn. I 1987, eller i studieåret 87-88, dro det ut 3200 studenter med Erasmus i Europa. Det tallet er hundredoblet i 2017, bortimot. Rundt 300 000 studenter årlig. Og i løpet av de 30 årene så har det kommet en million babyer, som en bonus på det. Og Erasmus-generasjonen er jo blitt et begrep i Europa, faktisk, i løpet av disse 30 årene. Så ting kan forandres fundamentalt over tid. Det er helt sikkert. I dag tar vi dette som en selvfølge. At det finnes mulighet til å dra med Erasmus eller med andre ordninger. At man kan reise på utveksling hvis man vil. Og vi ønsker å få flere ut. Men eh, la oss huske på det som Fabian Solek sa. Dette er jo ikke nødvendig som en selvfølge. Dette er verdier som følger at vi har et åpent samfunn. Verdier som følger at vi har eh, vekt på utdanning. At vi ønsker inkludering og nye perspektiver, og det er noe som vi må jobbe for. Og der tror jeg også internasjonaliseringsprogrammene i seg selv ikke bare er et resultat av dette, men de er også et verktøy for å bevare det. Og det er viktig. Nå skal jeg si så mye mer om dagen i dag. Jeg synes som sagt det har vært uh, inspirerende. Jeg håper at diskusjonene fortsetter uh, i kveld og i morgen, og ikke minst under middagen i kveld. Nå skal jeg si litt praktisk om den middagen. Uh, og nå får dere følge nøye med. I shall say this only once. For det første, hvis du lurer på noe meldt på middagen, se på kortet ditt. Har du en rød sirkel der, så har du meldt på middagen. Den finner altså sted i gamle losjen. Grev Veddels plass 2 står i programmet. Uh, nede ved den såkalte kvadraturen i Oslo. Det enkleste er å gå dit til fots, eventuelt ta en taxi. Det er ikke så mye offentlig transport som stopper i nærheten. Hvis man ønsker å gå sammen med andre, så går det en gruppe fra uh, ja, det som jeg fortsatt kaller for SAS-hotell, altså Radisson Blue Hotel her oppe på Holbergs plass, uh, klokka 6. Det er cirka 25 minutter å gå. Dørene åpnes halv sju, 18.30, og det vil bli en velkomstring som da serveres fra samme tidspunkt. Og så blir det mingling da i cirka fram til kvart over sju, og vi beregner at serveringen begynner cirka 1945, kvart på åtte. Så eh, hvis det er noen da som er vant til å spise middag sånn i 4.50, ja, eh, så er det altså en stund til det format, så det kan være greit å, å, å tenke på det. Eh, ikke bli for eh, desperat. Der er garderobe. Den koster 15 kroner. Ingen ublipis. Betales med kontant eller kort når en henter tøyet sitt. Ikke når en leverer, men vi må huske at en har penger eller kort til å hente. Så får dere i tillegg til velkomstingsen en drikke til maten. Øvrige drikke må dere betale selv. Og baren tar både kort og kontanter, så det skulle være eh, tatt godt hånd om. Etter maten så vil såkalt Strangersalen åpnes i sambygget, og der blir det anledning til å hygge seg videre, og det blir også DJ og, som byr opp til dans. Så det må man gjerne delta på, men husk at det begynner her i morgen klokka 9.00. <laughs> og så når vi lærer fart fra i dag, så eh, tar det litt tid å komme seg inn og falle på plass. Så skal vi begynne klokka 9, så er det fint om man er her litt grann før 9, sånn at vi kan begynne eh, på tida. I morgen blir det jo da først uh, en plenumsesjon her, og så blir det parallellsesjoner resten av dagen. Men jeg skal få mer informasjon om det uh, når vi kommer her i morgen. Og selv om vi bare er halvveis i årets internasjonaliseringskonferanse, så hviler internasjonaliseringskonferansen aldri. Uh, og derfor så vil jeg be uh, Jan Atle Toska komme opp her. Han er studiesjef ved et universitet som du helt sikkert vil ha lyst til å besøke om nok så nøyaktig ett år. Vær så god. Ja, takk for eh, invitasjonen opp på scenen her da. Eh, jeg er da studiesjef på det relativt nyfusjonerte Nord Universitet som består av gamle høyskolen i Nord-Trøndelag, 
högskolan i Nesna och universitetet i Norrland. En ganska vi och stor och spredd institution eh, som ligger på bägge sidor av, av polarcirkeln. Eh, och grunden till det är er att få invitera till nästa års internationaliseringskonferens 14 och 15 mars. Det blir då vid Nord universitet. Vi fick eh, rektor Björn Olsen att skriva under i förgårs. Så eh, vi pressade lite på att han skulle skriva under avtal för vi den konferensen var så vi kunde se si det. Så må vi ju vara lite precis när det gäller invitation till Nord universitet för det har ju ni studiestäder. Så invitationen är på det näst norrligaste studiestäder, det är er Bode. Så att eh, där får komma norr för Polarcirkeln. Det är er egentligen bara två av studiestäderna som ligger norr för Polarcirkeln. Men vi vet ju det norr för där ja så ligger ju det arktiska universitetet så det var verkligen kommer norrligt. Jag kan ju önska er alla välkomna. Jag är er ju utvandrat bergensa först 10 år i Oslo så 22 år i Norge. Man blir ofta lite chockerad när i alla fall utan det folk kanske inte danner det folk ser att de aldrig har varit i bergen det blir er stadig lika överraskande då det är er lite svårt att förstå man man blir vant att det vart att se ja har aldrig varit i Bodø och aldrig varit norr för Trondheim det hör man lite oftare då men det är er hjärtligt välkommen norrover hela gängen och det kan si det det vill bli gott att emot jag själv har följt mig ganska gott att emot i 22 år jag har varit i i Tromsø i Bodø då så så Välkommen till det andra om cirka nöjaktig nästan nöjaktig ett år alltså 14 och 15 mars. Så där ses vi i Bode.